Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for resisting until the last day. Maybe I can drop the volume a bit. Hello, hello. One, two. Yeah. Better? Okay. Um, yes, as, as has been anticipated, the program will be about viewing some of the data. Uh, first of all, we will talk a bit about uh, auto ratification and then we'll we'll share with you two videos about applications one by dr medba crawford for the university and one by dr carson roberts my colleague and of course i welcome also everybody who is following us online thanks for being online with us okay so the uh, what was missing yesterday was to show you how you uh, perform a norto ratification so basically how you convert an image like this into something like this an image like this is always looking like a perfect rectangle because this is just the acquisition in time by the camera but it's not corrected as you can see there are some uh, effects given by roll and pitch and your changes during the flight and these are always reflected in the image no okay so this one here for example is reflected by this so every every um variation is compensated by by the auto ratification process and this is what you want to uh to geolocate your information <coughs> auto ratification is basically about transforming the 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 this type, this kind of projection into something that is an orthogonal view of the ground okay so removing the distortion effects of tilt and terrain relief okay so as a as a uh, as a result the process of this process the data are, uh, the result of the result of this process is data that are outlined on a scale that is constant okay allowing for accurate measurement when calculating distance and direction so you move so from something that has a perspective projection and on uniform scale to something that has an orthogonal projection to the ground and a uniform scale to give you just a a quick um a quick uh intuitive information just consider this like a like this uh, okay
Yes. Ah, so people. People are viewing this one, okay, instead of the. So what's the problem? The people view. Is both uh, screen is coming. Okay. You choose only this one. Understood. Yeah. Then. What if we try the extension? How is it now? Yeah, it's kind of. Oh. No. Yeah. No, oh, wait. Stop share. Optimize for video clip. Yeah. Oh, now it's no. I can share that. It's not very elegant, but I can share. Okay. I can share only this. Yeah. So I can do this. I can remove. I can reduce. Okay. Now. Okay. Second. Okay. This one. Again. It doesn't seem to be. Yeah, but you they see you you see always the same. Now you see. So probably we, we can do this. Yeah. It's not a big presentation, but better than nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, one second. What do you see now? Do you see the changes? Like, do you see the changes? What do you see now? You see the one with the white? Okay. Uh, do you see the changes now? Okay, okay. Okay, back to our presentation. Okay, so uh, basically uh, the authentication adjusts the image as is every pixel was exactly nadir when the image was taken. This is probably uh, the most important point. This eliminates distortion given by the apparent distance between objects due to the viewing angle. Object will appear to lean outward from the central pixel. Okay, so it's like, you remember the story about the, 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 uh, the array of the camera? Instead of thinking that the lens is viewing things like this, it's like every pixel of the array of the camera is viewing down nadir. Authentication allows accurate measurement of distance between objects. It creates a map view. Hmm? Okay, so this is what you get. A perspective image against a nadir view. <clears throat> or again, a perspective image and the nadir view. Hmm? So every, everything is viewed orthogonally to the ground. Okay, so back to the back to the uh, we talk we talk about tilts and the effects. This is what you have to control measure uh, in order to operate a geolocation of pixels when you fly. The roll axis when the 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 the, the vehicle does like this. The pitch axis when the vehicle pitches back and forth, and the, the yaw axis. That's the orientation towards the flying direction. And this is something measured by the inertial measuring unit. The GPS is measuring, the, the, the constantly measuring latitude, long, longitude, and altitude. So there are six things that every frame of the camera has associated in order to uh, geolocate every pixel very accurately. Hmm. Okay, just another visualization. We are flying over a terrain. So the, the, um, the orthorectification of an image means to basically to throw everything down on a flat, on a flat level, giving a geoposition to each pixel. So what it's very important to feed your orthorectification process with information about the GPS and the IMU, the ones that I showed in the previous slide, and the dam. So you got to inform the software, the orthorectification software, about the shape of the ground. It's, it's got, it, it has to be told about the uh, terrain elevation, terrain shape, so that all these things can be done, reprojected on a flat surface, your orthorectification, your orthorectified image. From here, terrain relief, viewing angles, perspective angles to here, orthogonal view. Okay, we will see that in the, in the real life example. These are the two main things we have to assign to uh, give to the soft feed to the software with. Where we were and on what we were flying. So again, the projection of the sensor projects this data onto a flat map, corrects image distortions due to row, pitch, yaw, and terrain relief, and geolocates things, geolocates pixels. Okay, the, I'm not running the presentation, so these things cannot be run as an animation, I'm afraid, because they, uh, otherwise they, um, our, our uh, folks on the line won't see that. Let me try anyway, just for the benefit of, uh, okay, of you. 
this is just a uh, the roll effect, the pitching effect. This is the viewing slit of the camera. Remember, the camera sees through a slit. It's like your eyes looking through a line. This is the pitching effect. This is the flight direction. This is always the, the flight direction is always like this. And this is the yawing. In the flight direction, the camera is not viewing properly, but it's viewing with an angle. Okay, now I can come back to the, oh, there is another view, animated slide, so I will stay in this mode. Then we will return to the, um, to the other mode. So the auto rectification effects, considering the orientation of the slit of the imaging spectrometer, again, can be can be viewed can be viewed like a uh, like a, a shift in in the in the in the direction, so that the, the against the orientation of the slit in the imaging spectrometer. Whereas the GPS IMU is always pointing like this. So whenever Whenever there is a, whenever there is a, an effect given by raw pitch and yaw, we have a an offset between the GPS and MU pointing and the orientation of the of the view of the spectrometer. Okay, so I will go back to this mode. So hopefully you should see that. Is that okay? Okay, so how can we prevent? as much as possible, this kind of effects. Um, I don't recall if we, yesterday we, we mentioned that, but uh, you have seen during the, the, the demonstration yesterday that the camera is not standalone on the UAV, it's mounted on a gimbal, something that is actively, continuously compensating real time for all these roll and pitch and yaw effects. You can mount the camera on a gimbal, ideally, or you can mount it directly on a, in, uh, under, under the UAV. So a gimbal is meant to be stabilizing raw pitch and yaw in, 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 in real time. A vibration isolated mount, so this kind of mount with dumpers, with four dumpers, has no gimbal. And uh, basically in, in short, the camera follows the drone. So whatever happens to the drone is happening also to the camera. In a gimbal situation, the gimbal is meant to keep the camera stable, whatever the UAV does, with a, with a, uh, um, <clears throat> with a non-gimbaled, uh, uh, in a non-gimbaled uh, mounting, the camera follows the UAV. So whatever roll or pitch the UAV does, same the camera. So there are more distortions in raw data and a high performance GPS CMU that controls, that measures all these variations very accurately is, is much recommended. Sometimes cameras that are bigger than the nano you've seen yesterday must be mounted without a gimbal because simply there are no gimbals that can fit those cameras. Well, maybe there are, but you, have, you, and you, you, you find another problem that the, the total weight of the UAV, including the gimbal, exceeds the 25 kilo limit. Okay, so sometimes you have to avoid the, the gimbal just for weight uh, reasons. <coughs> okay. This is another example. When you uh, ortho an image that comes from a uh, gimbal mount versus a vibration isolated mount, if you are using a high performing GPS IMU, <coughs> you still get a proper correction. So things look straight, straight streets are straight, parking lot lines are straight, but you see all these effects at the side are all signs that a lot of rolling has, and pitching has had to be adjusted because they happened to the system when it was flying. When you have a gimbal mount, you still get a very nice, even better potentially compensation. And uh, um, uh, what you get is that even 
the resulting the resulting uh, ortho seems fine because all these shakes have been uh, originally compensated for. <coughs> So in general, uh, the isolated mount gives you a slight worse orthorectification, especially when you want to mosaic all this data. Thankfully, having a high-performing GPS IMU mounted on the system gives, still gives you a very, very, very good uh, orthorectification. Okay. This is a comparison of the uh, of two GPS IMUs we used to offer uh, with our head with our headwall packages. The standard one is not available any longer due to um, performance issues. We have decided to offer just the high performing one, but both are actually good for for uh, uh, and useful for data authentication. This little guy here is the guy that was attached to the Nano yesterday. The um, uh, the difference is that with the basic GPS, you can start using the data immediately after after the um, the, auto, the flight. With the high performing GPS, you must go through a post processing called PPK post processing kinematic that requires to adjust the position of the raw data of the GPS against a uh, a base station. A base station is basically something that sits on the ground or in a, in a position, steadily in a position, and <coughs> collects continuous data about its own position and stands as a reference for correcting raw GPS data. So when you use a high-performing GPS IMU, you're always recorrecting your original GPS data against a base station to generate what is called SBET, a smoothed best estimate of trajectory. Whereas the standard GPS MU is not adjustable for high accuracy. <clears throat> As a result, just to give you some um, practical numbers, uh, the, the standard GPS has this kind of error. Okay, this should be, okay, this is actually plus minus 2.5. Actually, I, this table is, um, the, the, this kind of error, you are, you, are, you are measuring the GPS resolution in terms of meters of accuracy, whereas with a high performance GPS, you are in the range of five centimeters of accuracy for X, Y, and Z. And uh, um, even in the IMU uh, correction, you see that you are in an order of magnitude better, doing better than the standard one. This is what makes the high performing GPS highly desirable especially in the vertical axis. Because as I said many times, as you've seen in the picture showing the terrain, it's very important to know precisely how tall you are on the terrain. Very important because the pixel, you, uh, when, you, when you alter the map, you got to know the distance from the object accurately in order, in order to uh, be able to reproject the pixel on the ortho image properly based on uh, on, on the distance from, from, from the target. So it's very important to have a high accuracy in Z in, in, in the vertical axis. <clears throat> Taken as, a, as an indication, the, um, starting from the, uh, starting from the um, manufacturer specification in accuracy, if you put all these things together, all these six things together, Raw, pitch, yaw, and X, Y, Z into a big Euclidean, multidimensional Euclidean distance, you can predict, have an idea of how precise, how accurate you can be at every altitude of flight. Yesterday we flew about 20 meters. So you can expect that the geolocation error that sums up all the things that the GPS and IMU measure can give you an expected accuracy of plus minus four meters. Whereas you can, you can probably expect something in the range of 10 centimeters of accuracy of geolocation using a post-processing kinematic. Again, again, the uh, 
Post-processing kinematic means correcting raw data against a reference on the ground, a base station on the ground. It can be a, your own station that you can carry in the field and you buy from a plan, it's from Trimble and <clears throat> as, as a reference, or it can be a public station, uh, airports, military bases, any public station available around you performs like a base station. Okay, and this is again, another explanation. A base station, is a stationary point with a known location and that this base station corrects your data in post-processing. There are many drones that fly in RTK mode. So the correction is applied during flight. Our GPS data are corrected in post-processing in a PPK mode, post-processing kinematic. This is real-time kinematic. Hmm? So you keep a state, you have you, you can have your own station as a cell, you can use um, a public station and you can actually correct your measured location to an actual location. It's just a correction factor to all your GPS data. It's extra work of processing, but as, as you seen by the table, it pays back a lot. Um, this station does not have to be confused with ground control points. Ground control points are points that we have a known GPS location and uh, are placed by the users and uh, measured on the ground to give them an accurate GPS position. And they are typically used in photogrammetry and other techniques that I'm not covering today. Headwall does not use ground control points we use the base station mode. So this is just to tell you that not to confuse them. Should you have heard about them, they are two different things. All right, so um, the presentation is over. We can go through a visualization of the data. Uh, of course, let me know if you have any question. There's something from the chat, but I guess it's just like the classical icons here. No, okay. Any questions so far? All right. Well, if you have questions, just raise your hands anytime. Okay. <clears throat> One second, I'll open up the data now and we can view them. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just one second. Okay. Just, just a moment, I'm making sure that I got the proper data. <coughs> okay, wait, all right. Mm. Okay, wonderful. Okay, let's go back to our Spectral View software. So try to keep in mind all the principles that I try to explain. And let's open up for now uh, just one data cube. Okay, let's open it in reflectance. I just need the, the three bands now to, for visualization. I don't need to open all wavelengths now. 
Okay, so here we are. As you as you have seen, um, the um, these data are not corrected. They appear always like a perfect rectangle. And as you can see, there are not significant big shakes effect, shaking effects uh, across the flight, thanks to the gimbal, of course. Orthoing the, the data, we don't need to go through the entire manual process, but you have to see what's of importance for uh, your work. So don't bother to see where I click, just concentrate on the principles. Okay. Yeah. I'm... Okay, I should be sharing now, right? Thanks, I forget because I got the screen, it makes confusion. One second, okay. Okay, so um, I told you when you prepare auto ratification, you basically have to feed your system with um, information related to the uh, GPS MU file, so all the story of your flight and the, the, the digital elevation model. The story of this flight is looking like this. It's colored by time. Okay, so there was there was a takeoff. There was a beginning. A, there was a pre. Uh, there was a an, an approach of the UAV to the first point. All the lines were done, and then the end. The system returned home. This is the story. You can view it in by elevation also. And this is what happened in the area of interest. All these turns were not measured. The polygon was drawn around this area. So we told the camera, don't collect data when you are not in this square or rectangle. So the camera measured, stopped measuring any time it was out of this polygon. We measured only into that. And for each line of uh, this flight, uh, several things were recorded. The yaw, the orientation. The, um, basically what you want to see here, and this is a very good example, is a periodic behavior. Rather than viewing, uh, uh, unless there are very dramatic effects, uh, you just want to view that for each line, line, this line, then it, we were out of the polygon, second line out of the polygon, third line and so on. The, the behavior is periodic. And roll and pitch likewise. This, how the camera was rolling and pitching. I'm happy when I see uh, this kind of periodic repetitive behavior. That's all I look for. But as I said, uh, you, the only thing you have to think here is that every line of the flight has associated this information. Line one, line two, all these things have come with an associated information about the status of the camera in each moment. That's what you have to remember. And the DEM gives you the digital terrain model. This is not a accurate DEM, so we still have to associate and um, make some corrections. The software allows for a geoid correction. That means basically, correcting for the geoid model. Uh, this is still necessary with DMs with such a large grid. And uh, um, so the pitch was 0 0.7, okay. The roll was 0 0.2. I made, I changed it so I have to adapt it. And this was minus one. This one and the offset. Three. This is what I got from your uh, Ortoini 
Correct me if there's anything wrong, please. Okay, so we are feeding the software with the Emo GPS. We are feeding the DM with this information. What are we doing here now? What we are doing is to input what are called bore sighting coefficients. The bore sighting coefficients are initially given by the factory and they are coefficients of displacement between the camera and the GPS and the, and the IMU, okay? So the, the IMU is an accelerometer and every camera has an accelerometer that comes to as an IMU, but every camera and accelerometer are slightly different. So the, the, the physical relationship, the displacement between the center of gravity of the camera and the IMU is always different camera to camera. So every camera comes with its own bore sighting. By giving these bore sighting coefficients, you are basically uh, correcting for this kind of displacements. You are aligning the view of the GPS with the view of the camera. Uh, sorry, the view of the IMU with the view of the camera. The, um, uh, towards the, the, the ground. These factors uh, can be tweaked, can be adjusted, and the adjustments uh, uh, are typically not so necessary when you have a high-performing GPS. Typically, the, the high-performing GPS is so accurate that uh, uh, it doesn't require adjust, big adjustments, maybe a 0 0.1, a big little adjustment. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the standard uh, GPS many times requires a certain, a certain adjustment. Together with the, uh, uh, the geoid correction uh, and, uh, and the altitude offset, the, these two things, work to, um, to correct for this kind, this kind of, uh, of, of factors. So the, uh, you, gotta, you gotta get a proper reconstructed resolution and the proper relationship between the GPS altitude and the DEM altitude. So if you have a good DEM and, uh, and uh, uh, you have a proper GPS measurement, the difference between the two should represent your, your, flight, uh, your flight altitude. But let's view that physically with, uh, um, with the, uh, the results. Maybe this was not to be great. Okay, this is what we do get. Where's the tarp? Okay, we need to, maybe this was not in use. Okay, yeah. Okay, this is our resulting, uh, resulting image. This is just a preview. As you see, we are already plotting this image in latitude and longitude. And we are already uh, looking at a, rec a, a reprojected image, orthorectified image against a system of coordinates. What we've done was to, as I, I will say that again, feeding the system with the story of the flight, giving the system a DM and uh, um, using the, the borsitin coefficients and working with the altitude offset. The altitude offset in practice, uh, with, without the theory about the uh, geoid and ellipsoid modeling thing, without the theory about the GPS, the, the ellipsoid and the geoid, which was something that someone else knows much better than me, practically speaking, has an effect on, sh on giving shape to things in the image. Um, you remember Dr. Sahus yesterday said that the calibration tarp is a perfect example of something that has a known size on the ground, and that can really work as a tutor, as a tutor for saying, okay, I'm sizing things properly. 
practically, let's say that I use another number, whatever. <clears throat> okay now everything looks just just wrong <laughs> there is a wrong uh, a wrong uh, geoid correction and the image looks completely unusable so you, you the a proper a proper um, correction factor has to be found called this this so called altitude offset in order to get a proper a proper um, uh, sizing of the image in practice now i'm coming close to my to my uh desired results because the flight was taken at uh, about uh, 27 meters was it more or less the same okay within a certain error remember this kind of gps has kind of an error in vertical altitude and the resolution the pixel size was about uh, four centimeters so when you get these values correct you're you're going it's going okay everything's going okay when you don't get these values correct nothing is going well because you can see the gps is even lower than the dm it's like you flew on you flew underground so this this is wrong this is just wrong so you got to monitor these things until you get a proper um, sizing of the image sizing things is very important because uh when you have to put images together, if they are not sized properly, they will, for example, if things are, if objects are made um, too large, the two fly lines, two parallel fly lines will overlap too much. So an apple in, on the first line and an apple on the second line will be looking like two apples like this because you do made them too large. On the contrary, if you, if you make objects too small, they will, they will separate. They, an apple measured in two fly lines will look like two apples distant from each other. Only properly sizing things will make the following the two adjacent adjacent lines match properly. It's very 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 important. So don't start uh, spending your time playing with roll and pitch and yaw until you found proper settings of altitude offset to um, properly size up, uh, your, your things. This kind of digital elevation model has a uh, 90 meter grid. So it's very, uh, it's got a very poor resolution. It's not able to explain uh, all the details of the terrain. And basically this is why I need such a big altitude offset. I'll show you another example made by a DDM generated through LIDAR that has no need at all to control the altitude offset, if but a little adjustment that I, and I will explain you why. Because the geodem, the, 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 the DM we are using is just uh, super strong. Okay, let's continue. Uh, let's redo it. <clears throat> Next, let's save it. Okay, now I, I'm viewing all the RGB, RGB bands now, just to be faster. I'm just using three bands instead of 270. So here's my result. An image that now shows me, uh, you see this little, this little um, variation means that the UAV was probably rolling a bit or whatever happens on the UAV or mm, many effects. So even, even a change in altitude can give you a larger or a smaller swath. So all these things are shown here, but everything has been corrected. So things that are meant to be straight are actually straight. So what I can do before I mosaic all these lines together is for example, to check for how 
this work look this work looks like by for example projecting the image onto google maps and here i am can you can see that right on zoom yeah okay so here's a projection of my of my lines um projecting uh things in agriculture is always quite uh um, let's say it's not always easy because uh, the, the scenario in agriculture changes. So Google map might have taken this image in a different season and, and stuff like that. So it's not always uh, the ideal. The best you can do in such a scenario is probably to look for potential overlap uh, where roads are, like this road here. You can see how that matches with, uh, um, with, the, uh, with the road, but Again, it's not very it's not very easy. Sometimes it's more evident when you try to plot um, uh, something in in streets, on roads, in in cities. You have more artificial elements. But this is what you get. You can reproject uh, your your result in Google Map and see how that fits. Of course, Google Map is not a gold standard in terms of accuracy. This is just a quick viewer. You don't have to rely on the precision of Google Map to judge, but uh, this is just um, a nice viewer to see in what direction you're going. So I always recommend that you give a quick look into, into GMAPs to see how you're doing. Let me see how we are doing with timing. Okay. Okay. The, um, the final step here is, is saying, okay, I'm happy. I'm doing the same. I'm printing all the flight lines the same, and I'm putting them together. The um, we don't again. We, I don't have to show you to keep you here waiting for the whole process. But uh, what the software does when you create when you or, or when you uh, process uh, raw images in batch is to give you the opportunity to save. One second, because the, 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 the DM is big to load. I just need to show you a little, a little feature. I could have shown that to you before, but. this little option you have here when you process a single image or when you do it uh, is the same when you do it in batch is the same you you have the possibility to operate to 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 select this option that is saving only or also latitude and longitude files information about this plot in a file called igm igms are uh, small light files that can be generated and they carry just information about the position of each image so that when you operate <clears throat> a mosaicing you have to be looking not for the original data cubes but for these igms if i select these igms and i put them all together to to finalize my mosaic The software gives me a preview of how the image looks like. Okay, so this is a nice. There's a there's a nice. Um, well, not not so nice visually, but intuitive uh, visualization. If you look at that, you remember the forty percent overlap. See how that's actually quite precise, right? There's an area which is free from overlap, then another forty, the following line, another forty, the following line, and so on. So this is exactly what you want to get a nice good overlap between lines, making sure that no gaps between lines have been found. This uh, kind of pattern up and down, up and down is normal because actually the camera starts to record the data a little later than when it enters the polygon and stops to collect data a little after the end of the polygon. Therefore, you always have to be like start, pause, start pose this up and down is very normal this is what you typically see 
And this is another good reason to make your polygon of interest a bit larger than the real area of interest, because if you make it exactly like that, you may be missing some bits. So make your polygon a bit smaller than the fly, than, than the, um, sorry, a bit larger than the area of interest. <clears throat> the final result of such a job is a mosaic. Uh, only RGB again. I don't want to show you the entire set of wavelengths for the moment. A mosaicing of all the flight lines together. This is a um, very good result for a standard performing GPS. There are still um, gaps between lines looking like this some effects that have not been fully compensated for. But there is a point, if you remember the, my table of accuracies, there is a point where, where with every model you are, you, are, you are using, you have to stop and say, okay, I reached the best of my performance. We can project that as well. And here we go. This is our, this is our guy. Again, uh, little things stay the same in time in agriculture. So there's probably nothing from Google Map that corresponded. However, you can see that, for example, the crop seems to finish more or less exactly where it's meant to finish. The road, this, this white part of the road of the, of the, uh, of the path between the crops seems to correspond. So it looks like the job has been properly uh, executed. Again, the, all the work that I showed you has been through from data collected with uh, the system which is here at the Yari and mounts a standard GPS. Now with a in little time remaining, like just uh, 15, 20 minutes, I wanna show you um, <clears throat> I want to show you what happens if you use a high-performing GPS and the LiDAR. I, I was quite quick yesterday, but uh, I've showed you that uh, uh, the Headwall software can generate a point cloud from a LiDAR measurement. And out of, the light, out of this LiDAR measurement, we can get a digital elevation model. So a, a, a map where every pixel carries information about the elevation, how the, the relief of the terrain. I'm sorry. Let's use just one second. Let me. Just one second and I'll be with you. Okay. Perfect. Okay, we should be there. You go back to my screen. Okay. Yeah. So this system is a nano system, a gimbaled 
a gimbal system. And uh, this is the, the, the information we captured about the elevation out of a LiDAR system that is mounted on the head of this nano. The nano you've seen has a nano on top and it flies and measures along with the camera. So this is now the kind of mod, the, the kind of, uh, of uh, uh, resolution I can achieve. The, the, uh, the DM that has been used for the authentication of the data here as a 90 or so it's 90 meter grid. This one is something probably in the range of uh, 25 centimeter grid. So every, for every, every, every pixel has a 25 centimeter size. So we can describe what's happening here incredibly accurately. So what I can, the, what I can simply do when I open, let's open again, just one, just one data cube. Let me see which one contains the tarp. Okay, this one, 30607. Here's my uncorrected image. You see how nice it looks. I wanna show you an image of the same scene we acquired the year late, one year later with our gimbal. But you should see how beautiful, no, you will see how beautifully it came out anyway. This is, more, this is the same area. Maybe I'm not seeing the same. This is the same area <laughs> measured <clears throat> without a gimbal. But still, we got wonderful data. The data that I showed you yesterday when I overlapped the map on the DM are coming from here. So you can, do, you can start from something like this and get to something like what I showed you yesterday. And then I'll show again, just to make sure that nobody's worried about not using a, uh, not using a, uh, a gimbal if the gimbal is not applicable. From, from this to this. Okay, let's, let, I don't wanna, let's stay on the examples that I was making. Mm, yeah, okay. This is my gimbal, so always preferable. Uh, it's almost ready. <laughs> it's almost three by three already without even a correction. When I try to ortho this image, I can use this digital model. I can use this digital model to correct the image. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got my, my processed SBET, smoothed best estimated trajectory from the PPK data. So not rough the raw data, but process data against the base station, all the story that I showed you before, and this beautiful digital model. Everything fits without the minimum correction. No GI correction, no necessity for altitude offset, roll pitch in your ready from the factory. Basically, nothing has to be adjusted. There could be just one tiny adjustment that you, could, you can make, and that is on the effective focal length. In reality, the, specific, the manufacturer specification about focal length is not actual. For example, the 12 millimeter lens is, is 12.6. Um, uh, the 17 is, again, another, another uh, value. And this, if you keep these original numbers, you have a little additional distortion in the image given by 
especially at the edges, not in the central view of the camera, but at the edges. You can imagine that when you look laterally, the distortion you get here is definitely larger than the distortion you get in the center. Therefore, we have given the possibility in the latest version of uh, hyperspec to a uh, spectral view to adjust the, 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 the focal length to a more real value, which has the same effect as adjusting the altitude offset. So one or the other, are they, they are substi substitute to each other. As there is no need to correct for altitude offset, no need to reproject on the geoid, uh, based on the geoid correction, you just, you just have to be careful to potentially adjust the distortion given by the lens. In addition, we have provided users with a lens distortion uh, factor. And that also improves uh, the results. Let's leave it to, to zero for a moment, but typically for these lenses, it's like a plus two or minus two, but let's leave it like this for the moment. Okay, so things happen in the same way, just in a matter of nothing in time, finding the proper offsets. Once you know your uh, necessity of adjustment of focal length, um, I don't remember whether the 17 is actually a 17.34, I don't remember, but that's something we, we don't need to go through now. As long as I adjust my focal length, my borsitin coefficients are rock solid, the altitude offset doesn't need any touch. The DM is super precise. The S bed goes down to centimetric precision, and my results get much, much stronger than with the basic GPS. I want to show you the final mosaic. Let's use your three bands now. Okay, and here's the, here's the result. There are some gaps, I'll show you, I'll tell you why. Okay, still some little adjustments to be made, but now these, these effects that I intentionally left here to show you that you can still see some offset are in matters of centimeters. Probably in, out of the map, if I recall correctly, we flew 40 meters, so you can expect about maximum at 12 centimeter displacement but we are talking about 12 centimeters now. I'm not talking about uh, the, the meters the, the, of, the, of the other system. So I intentionally, I always intentionally leave some little displacement to see that is no magic. You still see, you, you, may, you might still wanna adjust the, um, the offsets a bit, but this all comes without any, any modification of the original setting, just feeding the system with a high accuracy GPS um, data set, an EMU data set, and a highly accurate, um, highly accurate um, DM. These uh, white dots are another story, but I believe you are, your brain is already quite boiling, so I, will, I don't want to explain that too much. The only thing I'm saying is that these gaps are points where the LIDAR didn't arrive, and the DM has no information. The, you, you can resolve it quite quickly by reducing the resolution of the DM. You may, instead of making a 10 centimeter grid in the DM, you make it 50 and all these gaps are filled. I'm not saying anything more about that because I don't want to give you excessive information for the moment. But this will be another interesting story for another workshop. Here we go. Again, good GMAP is not a Bible, but still a nice indication of how things are going. And here's my, here's my ortho.
Pois não. Ok. Uh, I think this is, I have another five minutes, but this is more or less all I wanted to show you. Again, what matters when you ortho systems, as GBS in Mustari, a good DM, how you make a better DM, you, you, you make your own digital model, you, you use a high accuracy uh, GPS MU, and you mosaic all this data. Any question? There's something here? No, nothing? <laughs> no questions? Yeah, uh, so we need to do the author verification after we complete that processing. Yeah. Once after the, the that's what uh, is recommended by Headwall. Yeah. Uh, spectral processing first, author certification afterwards. Because uh, when we do the spectral processing, the image is not author that uh, when you, um, um, well, the, when you author the information, the spectral data are meant to follow you. So you could also perform it afterwards. Um, however, uh, the recommendation by our engineers at Edwell is always to perform the spectral processing before the ortho in order to make sure that you're using the, um, the pure information that, I, that is collected uh, during the flight by the camera. Um, this is just a, a general recommendation, just because in the ortho and the, the, the placement of pixels, some information, I don't know, might shift from one pixel to another. I'm not sure about what I'm saying, but the, um, uh, the, uh, in terms of, uh, the, of spectral data, the, the raw image is carrying exactly what the camera measured at all times. So I would uh, agree with this kind of recommendation, though I think some other users have different philosophies. So it could be just uh, also a matter of uh, any user's philosophy. Um, the important message is that when you uh, place pixels in the scene, geolocate pixels, the spectral info comes with it. The limit. Yeah. What is the maximum we can do that actually? See, if you are from it's actually more than the maximum is the is the minimum. So um, it is based on the accuracy, right? Yeah. So you, it's uh, if the accuracy, for example, of the yaw in PPK is zero point zero eight, uh, nothing under that value is something that the system understands. Uh, is, is the same, let's say. Uh, if it's plus minus 0 0.08, whatever is in that tolerance is not uh, discriminated by, by the yaw. Mm. Well, so what, what is your question? Is that based on? Uh, yesterday we went to the field. Yeah. We have flown. Yeah. We have captured the image. Yeah. And uh, when I do the processing, yeah. and if I find that uh, I'm not able to authenticate properly, mm -hmm. so is it possible to find out before doing the authentication that this is uh, those based, those based who attract, yeah. is there a, is there a something who attract that this data is not good for us? Oh, well, who that should be a very dramatic event, actually. Um, light. Yes, I hope I can answer your question. Uh, I hope um, there are things that are not um, controllable by your certification. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they are things related to what the such paste are white grub, W H I T G R U B, white grub. White grub, cutworm, cutworm, rice system borer, rice system borer, leaf hopper, rice system borer, leaf hopper, leaf hopper. ETC, 
is used to trap is used is used to trap 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 so by co kaitar pillar kaitar pillar c a t e r p i l l a r kaitar pillar full stop different type of trap different type of trap are used to are used to trap rat full stop pheromone trap pheromone p h e r o m o n e pheromone trap which which jante hain example se this cs9 cs9 trans 11 trans 11 tetra deca bye Dye nine. Acid. Dye zero moons. Ye agar aap raatri ke samay jaise light trap lagate hain, to jo jo main kira likha raha hu, ye pit, atwar, ye raat ko ghar ki taraf aakar sit hote hain. To lalas dene ke liye humne lagaya hai apne khet ke andar. और उसी ट्रैप में जब जाएगा तो गिरेगा वहीं पर ब्लू है और कुछ केमिकल्स है उसी में गिरेगा और खत्म हो जाएगा इसीलिए जो आज मॉडर्न खेती की जा रही है उसमें हम लाइट ट्रैप भी लगा देते हैं ये मैकेनिकल के अंतर्गत आता है नेक्स्ट है यूज ऑफ ट्रेंच इसमें लिखेंगे इंग्लिश में था थर्टी इंटू फोर्टी फाइव सेंटीमीटर डिगिंग इन दाइल एंड प्रिपेयर द ट्रेंस हमारा कहने का मतलब ये है कि आप ये चालीस गुणे जो आपका है पैंतीस से आपका जो चार पैतालीस सेंटीमीटर आप ट्रेंच बनाते हैं 
यहाँ पर डस्टर नहीं देखिए इसमें क्या करते हैं ऐसे से इस तरीके से जो इनसे प्रेम का आता है किसी भी मिलेगा और इसी में ही जब वातावरण की ये सब हल्का सा जो है बना लेते हैं और उसी में गिरेगा और मर जाए एज ए कंडीशन ये सभी चीजें मकैनिकल के अंतर्गत आती हैं क्योंकि तो आप भूमियों को खोद कर बना रहे हैं मनुष्यों द्वारा जो बनाई गई नियंत्रण है उसे हम मकेनिकल कंट्रोल के अंतर्गत रखते हैं नेक्स्ट है स्पाइक थ्रस्ट मेथड स्पाइक स्पाइक मेथड मतलब क्या होता है चूजा हाँ तो स्पाइक मतलब टूल्स है ये जिसे हम लोग बोरी सीते हैं वही है इसका काम क्या है जानते हैं सबसे पहले हम ये देखते हैं कि हमारे पेड़ में कहा जहां पर छेद किया हुआ है वहां पर कीट लगे हैं और उसमें मौजूद भी हैं उससे पता ये लगता है कि हल्का सा आप लेप लगा दी ठीक जब वह लेप उसको हटा देगा तो उसको पता चल जाएगा कि आपको किसमें आपका कीड़ा मौजूद है फिर उसी चूजे की सहायता से आप उसको मार दीजिए तो ये स्पाइक टूल्स का ही इस्तेमाल इसमें किया जाता है तो लिखिए आयरन हुक आयरन हुक आई आर ओ एन आयरन हुक आयरन हुक आर यूज टू आयरन हो आर यूज टू किल व्हाइट ग्रब व्हाइट ग्रब डब्ल्यू एच आई टी व्हाइट ग्रब गैडा को इंग्लिश में क्या कहते हैं भाई हाँ हाँ तो वही लिखो रायनो सोरोस बीटल ये बीटल है वो गैडा नहीं है ये रहाइनो सेरोस आर एच आई एन ओ नहीं आई है आई एन ओ सी आर ओ एस रायनो सेरोस बीटल प्रेजेंट इन प्रेजेंट इन कोकोनट कोकोनट क्राउन कोकोनट क्राउन दिस मेथड इज ए स्पाइक थ्रस्ट दिस मेथड इज ए स्पाइक थ्रस्ट टी एच आर यू एस टी थ्रस्ट मेथड थ्रस्ट मेथड एंड इज ऑल्सो यूज फॉर एंड ऑल्सो यूज
instead of capturing instead of capturing a single line and dispersing the information about the single line all the info from the scene is collected in one shot in a single frame in for headwell a frame is a line for these people frame is a frame what we more commonly think of as a frame this technique as is mentioned in this article by by the way he's a headwall user a great a great guy great user of ours he's also using uh, snapshot techniques to mention his description to quote the description in this article the snapshot techniques allows the recording of spatial and spectral information using a matrix detector where the uh, the type of uh, of the type of system of optical system is quite unique it's also very different from RGB measurement. So you don't have to compare snapshot with photography. They are not working in the same way. Snapshot enables the acquisition of a complete spectral data cube in a single integration, generating images directly from the area of interest. This approach allows to directly acquire data, reduces the post-processing complexity. However, that's the main point about uh, comparing hyper um, snap in the push broom with snapshot, um, its spatial and spectral resolution are limited, since the total number of voxels, so of of the elements you can use to receive the information out of the image image mapper, is limited to the number of pixels on the CCD. You cannot get any smaller than the the CCD the, the CCD pixels. Moreover, and this is a commonly uh, drawback of snapshot, common drawback of snapshot, this approach acquires hypercubes from different spectral ranges and number of bands and produces non-registered bands. Okay, that's the main point. The, in order to um, register an image, in order to complete an image in, in the snapshot technique, there has to be a a co-registration in order to avoid band disalignment. Maybe it's more intuitive here, where a voxel is, is a, is, this is just a simplification. This is a system with three voxels made of a number of CCDs on the detector. So you see that in this voxel, this rectangle containing several CCDs, not all elements of the voxel see the same wavelengths. Therefore, there has to be a co-registration of the image to avoid, to avoid the misalignment, as the article says. Comparing in, in practice, let's stay practical, comparing uh, framing to snapshot highlights the main disadvantages of um, um, snapshot that is given by low spatial and spectral resolution. I believe the, the camera with the highest number of bands on the market is about, I could be wrong, but I think it's about 50, 60 bands. And uh, absorption of light by filters mounted directly on chip causes increased thermal load which causes increased noise and instability of measurement. So this is slightly more unstable as a system than a push broom technique. The advantage of this technique is that you don't have to move. In certain scenarios, like, uh, well, it doesn't really too much matter in, in, uh, on a UAV, but if you wanna measure something from a tripod, for example, if you want to collect a scene from a tripod, you may find conditions of distance of the camera to acquire the scene in one single shot. Our camera needs to move. So you have to find a rotary stage that spans the area, that pans the area to and sweeps all the, all, the, all the pixels in the scene by moving. So in certain situations, for example, in a tripod solution, a snapshot has this advantage that it takes images without the necessity to move. In cultural heritage, for example, this is quite an advantage sometimes because not, not always you can put a rotary stage in a museum to scan a painting. You can come with this camera and make a shot. Yep.
Uh, at you didn't get join without with a video. Yeah, you can shut it off. Yeah. Okay. Then I have to share my screen. No, uh, no, no, uh, don't need I have to share my screen. Yes. Where, where you are putting that? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, but we don't need, the video has to be. Is it full screen? No. Uh, if you want a full screen, let's do it. Okay. If you want a full screen, we're going to go like this. It's okay here? Is that okay here? Yeah? Okay. Sorry for the Zoom interruption. All right. So, um, Can you share the full screen? You want, okay, you want this? Full screen window. You. Okay. So because we are only seeing the. Oh, sorry. This one. Here. Yes. New share. Where is the full screen window? Maybe. Not this. No, there's no. Um, it's tricky. Screen. Share the screen. Yeah. Screen. Share. Okay. Now I think it should go full screen. Okay, there, there are no animations here, so we can just keep it like this. <clears throat> All right, so this is a quite a common technique. And as I said, it's quite intriguing for users as it's um, acquiring the, the entire image in a snapshot. Still, the overlap between each image has to happen. So you cannot just uh, think that in one shot, all my email, all the images that I need to acquire by moving is acquired. There's still to do some um, overlap, but not needless, it's definitely true that uh, the advantage of not having to move the sensor or capturing a snapshot can have its advantages. Versus the, as I mentioned, the the disadvantages of having a definitely a lower spatial and spectral resolution. So let's focus on how we work. As I, as I mentioned, uh, the way we uh, work is by acquiring, uh, by acquiring frames. So as we move across the, the flight, so this is also a time dimension, a temporal dimension, we capture a spectral line in each frame. So every pixel has its own spectral dimension. Okay, it's like having, it's like having, uh, I don't know, 640 or 1000 little prisms that disperse the light for each pixel. That's how it works in another type of uh, visualization. And that, that's how we measure our lines, one by one as we fly. You have also seen that live outside. Okay, so the push broom, Spectral line scanning technology offers a uh, low distortion for a very high spatial and spectral resolution, has a high throughput of light with a high signal to noise ratio. And I will, I will mention about this. This is the head wall design. I will uh, mention that later. And it typically provides very 
uh, low stray light. And it's ideal for when the movement is between imager and scene or sample. So not just airborne, but also when you are, for example, keeping the camera on a conveyor belt in an industry, measuring the samples that income for inspection or translation stages when customers mount, when users mount cameras on a tractor in the field, for example. We've always been flying uh, in, on these days, but our systems can also quite easily be mounted on a tractor to view uh, the vineyards on the side or uh, to study plants from the side instead than from the top. So there are many situations where push broom is really, really ideal. Okay, and this is why they are generally the preferred technology for uh, high-end users. Whenever users wanna go for a high-end solution, Headwall or and its competitors, I, ha I have to say, all go for the push broom, the push broom techniques. I don't need to comment uh, everything here. Let's say that uh, one important point yeah, to mention here is that as I demonstrated in the previous session, we can achieve a very proper co-registration of sample pixel and their own spectral content. The spectral content of each pixel is carried along all the time during the processing of the data. Now, staying into the world of uh, push broom, there are multiple ways of measuring in push broom mode. The most common ways, at least the ones that are commonly on the market, are the reflective mode, which, is, uh, which also is patented by Headwall, and the transmissive mode, the PGP, prism, grating prism. Just uh, two, two images here. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Let's see how the PGP works. Um, I hope you remember the structure of our, how our system works. I will go through that again. But this is how the PGP technology works in great, uh, in great uh, uh, detail. Um, the PGP technology is basically transmissive. Instead of having the light reflected through the optical elements, the PGP technology has it going through a naxally transmissive optical path that is mostly, that has its heart, its heart, its main uh, component in the PGP structure, a prism, a grating, and the prism. And lights get through and down until the matrix detector. So it's still push broom because you see the slit, but it's based on a different way of conveying light. This system has the particularity of having a lot of points of contact of light to materials. Every material is an optical element with its coating, generating potential scattering. So let's say the caveat of this system is that any error at, the, at one point is propagated all through the system. But this is basically the structure. This PGP system is the main uh, beating heart of, of, this, of, of the solution. Light is dispersed uh, here, of course. So the pros are that it can definitely be low cost sometimes. It's got a fairly high throughput because light is not reflected. The light goes all through down to the end. So it's potentially got a high throughput of light, but the, the, the con, the caveats are is that it's a transmissive material with a lot of uh, um, potential uh, uh, propagation of error all through the, all through the, um, uh, the structure and with a certain level of chromatic dispersion. Therefore, typically this system have a higher stray light than, uh, than reflective system. And 
considering that materials, any material has a slight uh, in change of shape, inflation or deflation with temperature, you can imagine how critical any variation of shape given by temperature effect is in a structure like this. The, the, a change in, in, in the light path in terms of shape of the material, of, of the size of the material, a change, the inflation of the, of the dimension or, or vice versa, shrinking by, by, the, by the cold, it gives a potential error in the measurement. Therefore, these are not systems that are most commonly used, for example, in space, in satellites. They are not typically the, the, the primary choice for a system that goes uh, on a low Earth orbit, uh, for example, uh, uh, system. So how, uh, how does our sensor work? Instead of having a transmission of lights, our system is fully reflective. This, with the exception of the initial lens, of the, of the lens, after the slit, light is conveyed through a series of a couple of con concave mirrors and the grating. And it's all, all, all reflective. As you can see, the number of contact surfaces of light is definitely lower. I count one, two, three, and four, basically, instead of eight or nine compared to the, to the PGP. So light goes through here, is, this, is conveyed on a first uh, mirror, focusing mirror, hits the grating and gets dispersed and finally reaches the, the imager. This is how it works in basically every system we, we manufacture. They are very much the state of the art. They are used by all major um, space, space agencies. The aberration correction feature, correction feature is a patented uh, design. I will mention that again later. And all the, the all reflective design elim eliminates chromatic aberration for excellent focus over the entire spectral range, giving a very low stray light for a very high photometric accuracy. Now, I mentioned this, uh, um, this low, oops, sorry, this low uh, distortion uh, system. Basically, um, you may have seen, you may have heard about, uh, let me see if I have an image of that. No, um, I've uh, mentioned that um, a few times, probably uh, yesterday, or it's been mentioned, the, uh, the, the pixels you measure may be subject to the to optical distortions given simply by how they project on, on the detector. This and we may see that from here. So what you may get in a, in a situation, in a situation like, like this is that instead of being of pixels being projected squarely on the target, they may incur into smile effects, this kind of shape or keystone effect. They, they hit the, 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 the element on the array like this. This means that if you are in a, such a situation, which is, cannot be fully eliminated, but, is, but can be definitely minimized by a proper design, the information of pixels is, is mixed and you're not measuring, um, you're not as a measuring the, the information of your pixel as you would think to. A smile, for example, like this of, a, of, the, of the pixel, instead of being square, it becomes like a smile, is that if the pixel is expected to be here and it's smiling like this, information is, is going, into the other pixel. And you really want to eliminate this kind of, this kind of factors. Headwall has a patented aberration corrected design, but basically based on a convex grating, which especially at the edges of the gratings solves for the critical factors given by, given by these potential distortions and corrects for these effects by design. So you don't need to you don't need to correct 
for aberration in post-processing. Several systems from the competition use a post-processing to adjust smile and keystone. In our case, our correction happens directly on the grating, and there is no software solution we offer to post-correct that. So it's really important to consider that the grating, the system is great, it's so-called grating-based, is probably the most important factor to have a good imaging. You may think of the grating, even though it's reflective, as a, as a prism. Um, just an element, like, like uh, the ones that I was showing here, just an, an element that takes white light and disperses that. All these images show, show you a transmission, lights get through. But this kind of uh, dispersion can also happen in reflection. These gratings are not flat surfaces. They are finely grooved They're with uh, little, little grooves all across. And uh, uh, as you have surely, surely studied, in, studied in physics, this generates a dispersion of the white light into its, all, all its wavelengths. So this is definitely the, uh, the core of the, of the optical element, the most important uh, component of the optical element. And that's where we are. This is exactly what you've seen working uh, during these days. Uh, what you've seen, you, you, see, you will see working if you will visit the Yari again and you will work with this group or you will have your own camera. Every system is based on that. And thanks to this very compact design, uh, we can make it as small as we want without compromising performance. I would like to just finish with a little bit of terminology. Several words and expression have been used uh, during this workshop. And I would like to use the words of someone who is more expert than me to give you a bit of terminology that you can bring home and, and use it if you read articles, uh, hear workshops, or attend uh, any, any meeting. We've, men we've, we've been speaking about spectral range. How, where, where is my camera? What kind of wavelengths my camera is measuring? The nano is a visible NIR camera. It goes from 400 to 1000 nanometers. What is, what is a spectral sampling? Spectral sampling is, uh, yesterday I was talking about hyperspectral, how frequently I sample a wavelength. So when I build my spectral curve, how frequent is my sampling of a signal or to say it in another way, how many pixels do I have over on my detector to measure light? If, for example, I, uh, this nano uh, goes from 400 to 1,000 nanometers, so the, the range is made of 600 nanometers, the number of wavelengths is 270, 600, uh, 600 so 1,000 minus 400, 600, divided by 270 equals to 2.2. So the, the nano samples a wavelength every 2.2 nanometers. And not to be confused with that, the spectral resolution. The spectral resolution is the actual capability of a sensor to tell a to tell two close peaks, one from the other. I have two peaks in two, two bands, two, two, um, two peaks in my, in, my, in my spectrum. How uh, best can I discriminate between two pixels? Just to show you more visually, I know it's not very elegant, but it could be a visual help. I got my spectra, okay, my, my wavelengths and my, my sampling. So I got um, my sampling, for example, is at 2.2 nanometers. Every 2.2 nanometers, I have a, a wavelength. So how can I actually 
and you can see my mouse. Okay, how can I actually have, for example, two peaks close to it, one, one to the other? What is the maximum discrimination that I can get between two peaks? This is normally measured at half the height of the of a band, not at, at the at the baseline, not at the top, but uh, at half the height. This is why it's called half maximum. And at the full width of the peak, and this is why it's called FW full width, half maximum. This is an acronym that you may see sometimes when people talk about spectral resolution. Okay, I sample every 2.2, but what is my full width half maximum capability of telling one peak from the other? And that is given in the nano, for example, is six nanometers. I sample every 2.2, but my capability of discrimination is six nanometers. How is that made? Um, I told you, come back to the presentation that these cameras have an entrance slit. After the lens, which is a cylinder, lights go through a fenditure, a slit. This slit has a lens, light. So, the, the height, this slit has a width, but it's also has a height. Oh, horrible. Okay, it says it's got a height. This is what influences the resolution. In the case of the nano, this the, the height of the line, let's make it better. Okay, this is better. Okay, the light goes through the slit. So I'm now drawing the slit viewed on a, in a parallel way, the slit, has a as a oh ah, so okay the slit as a uh, certain certain height in the case of the nano for example the height of the slit is such that not one only the information from one pixel comes in spectrally i'm talking about spectrally but the information from three pixels comes. So the, the, this, this lit is actually about three pixels tall. And when I say pixels, I mean the size of the pixels on the detector. Okay, so I'm collecting information, which is, which is then, which is coming from in, to an equal of the height of three pixels put together. So I cannot say that my sampling is equal to my resolution, okay? If, I, if I, I can hear one person speaking, but if I put three people speaking together, my, and I put other three people nearby, my, and they all speak together, my best capability of resolving their signal from the other group is three people. Though I, uh, I was born to listen to one people only if I want. But in this kind of situation, I can only discriminate like this spectrally. And don't think about space, just think about the spectral information. Therefore, and be careful about that, because it's something that has to be well clarified when you look at the specification of a camera, head wall or whatever, spectral resolution is never equal to spectral sampling. It depends on how you, uh, define the number of pixels in the slit. It would be fantastic to have it equal, have just one, the, a, F, a, 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 a slit which is one pixel tall, but this would be a dramatic problem in terms of signal to noise. The signal to noise ratio would be quite uh, ruined. Okay, other term you may hear is crosstalk, the, is the interference from aviation rows and columns of pixels in the array. And that is given by Smile and Keystone. If, if I don't, if I, again, use, let me use my horrible drawing here. Instead of having um, an information like this, 
I'm getting information like, uh, like this, for example. This is a keystone effect, or this is a smile effect. So pixels are projected wrongly. And this is crosstalk. Pixels talk to each other. They shouldn't. Let me go through this. You may also hear what is an F number, and that's related uh, to the lens. Every lens in photography, not just in hyperspectral, have an F number. The F number is the ratio of the focal length to the system aperture. In other words, in practical, um, having a larger aperture, like your um, your eyes, hmm? having a larger aperture when your iris is open, you collect more signal and your depth of field, your capability to focus things at different distances from your eyes is greater. A, a smaller aperture is, um, gives, you, gives you the possibility to uh, focus, to have a lower, a lower signal throughput, and your depth of field is definitely compromised. So this is another, another number to, um, to bear in mind the F number. That's very common for those of you who are uh, interested in, in, uh, in photography. Some other terminology, the smile distortion, okay? Changes in spectral calibration as along, along the slit. It results in different spectral calibration in different column bending of spectral rows. So the, the, the rows are not straight, they're bent. Keystone distortion, that is like making things, making pixels look like a trapezoid. And that shifts the spatial position at different wavelengths and bends the spatial columns, less, less accurate mapping of pixels. And that, and that means less accurate mapping of pixels uh, to spatial location. I talk a lot of time about signal to noise. That is the ratio of the signal to the detector noise. High signal to noise is desirable. Thank you. Uh, when I was talking about uh, the different techniques, I mentioned the throughput. That is a name that is given to the amount of signal that goes in the slit and reaches the detector. A high throughput gives a high signal at the detector and improves the signal to noise. We mentioned many times the stray light. Uh, before we uh, took off yesterday, we put a cap on the lens and we measured the dark signal. And yesterday, I uh, corrected the raw images to radiance using the, this dark signal as a zero. Whatever the camera measures when it's blind, whatever signal I get when I close my eyes is stray light, is signal that does not belong to the things that I want to see around me. And, as, and that's considered stray light. It's the light in an optical system that is not well controlled and lands where it shouldn't. It affects the photometric accuracy and dynamic range and limits, okay, and has an effect also in uh, SNR. Of course, this belongs to the noise thing, so the SNR ratio in, um, does not really improve and it's got to be as low as possible. Uh, we haven't mentioned this, uh, this terminology ever, this is MTF, so I think I can leave it from there. It's, you may hear about that, it's modulation transfer function. It goes along with um, the definition of the resolution of the camera. Um, the spatial resolution of the camera is the spatial resolving, resolving power of a sensor. A high MTF yields to good spatial resolution. It's good to have it here in the glossary because it could be uh, seen by you sometimes, but it's not very common on the internet. When you, when you look at camera specifications online, I do or not, I don't think we'll, that the MTF is very much indicated. It's generally more about talking about spatial resolution. Any questions? Okay, so I uh, believe that uh, this is all I had to bother you with during this workshop.
Uh, we will continue after lunch with uh, the videos. I heard it's starting at two, but please stay around in case we uh, move any earlier. And uh, with the videos by Melba Crawford and Carson Roberts. If you have any questions, just uh, raise your hand or contact me separately. Thanks a lot for your attention. And thanks for the people being online.
Is it Zoom is there? Online? Okay. Is it audio? Uh, audible in Zoom also? Zoom and audio hanging Yeah, can you can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, for the last two days, yesterday and today, we have seen a lot of uh, hyperspectral data on drone. Uh, but generally, customers uh, before they fly, they they will start using the hyperspectral imager in the lab, so that they will get some experience on this, and then they will move to the field. Then only they will fly. So that's what we have uh, experience with the uh, Dr. Sagu and also other customers in the globe. So this particular hyperspectral imager, it can be used both in the lab, the field, as well as in drone or any moving platform. As uh, Francisco said, uh, it works on the push prune technology. So either you have to move the camera or you have to move the scene, the target. So typically uh, in the lab setup, uh, that's what uh, now they are setting it up. Usually we put the camera looking down and uh, we move the samples, targets in a conveyor belt or in a translation stage at a known speed, then this captures the image. Uh, this is what uh, maybe you would have seen it in a plant phenomics facility. So where their hyperspectral imagery is stationary and your parts are moving in a conveyor belt and it captures the image. In the field conditions, you can put the same camera, like uh, we have a videograph here in a tripod rotation stage. That's what they're setting it up. And we can scan the scene in front of you. So with a known speed, with a known angle, we can scan this scene so that we can capture the hyperspectral data. Once you are familiar with this, once you know the concept, once you know how it is working, then you can put the same camera in the drone and you can fly. So that is the power of your hyperspectral imager. You can use it in the lab, outdoor, and also in any moving platforms, drones, fixed wings, satellites, whatever it is. So how the lab data looks like. Suppose, for example, you have an hyperspectral imager and you want to use it in the lab and you want to collect some hyperspectral data of your targets, of your samples. The data looks same, like the field data, like the airborne data, what we have seen yesterday and today morning, the data looks same, but it will be much more clear. It will be much more, you will get a very good spectral information because we are very close. Your camera is very close to your target. You are going to have an artificial illumination, tungsten quartz halogen light source. So you'll get a good spectral information also with the spatial details. I have some couple of data so that I can share it with you. Uh, first, for example, let us let us have a field uh, lab data. So we have taken this data in uh, Indian Institute of uh, Space Science Technology in Tiruvannandapuram in their lab. They have a similar uh, VNAR imager, and uh, we try to put. Net is that no? We try to put the samples on the ground, and we illuminated with a light source. Then we mounted the camera looking nadir, and then we slightly scanned the camera with maybe two degrees, three degrees, so that we try to capture the image of your targets. We did not move the target because they don't have a conveyor belt. So instead of that, we slightly put the camera looking down, and we just capture the data. Okay. 
Yeah. This, 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 and this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, we have a internet issue. Okay. So I have some lab data which we have collected it with using our same hyperspectral imager, and uh, for example, I can open this data. This is a raw data, and uh, we can open all the two sixty seven bands, or we can open RGB bands, or if you want, want only I want particular band. I can also choose this. For example, if I select all 272 bands, it is going to load the data. And this is what the data looks like in the lab. If you collect it with the known targets like soil, leaves, plants, vegetables, whatever the interests of you, you can just put it. Uh, maybe we can turn off the light, uh, something, so that you will get a very clear image of your target. And uh, it gives you same thing. Each pixel will give you a spectral information and uh, you can just click the spectral information and then you can see that every pixel is going to give you a spectral data of your samples. So each one will have a different, different spectral signature. For example, this is a different one and this is a different one. And also you can see the background that is a different spectral signature. And also you can also, you can classify, you can do some qualification or quantification applications with this hyperspectral imager. For example, if I write, click and if I do the classification, what yesterday Francisco did, same thing I can do it for lab data also. So that it classifies the pixels only based on the matching, spectral matching. So wherever it matches, wherever it finds the carrot, it can you can easily identify it. So same thing, you can go for multiple classification also. So this is one of a good example to use the hyperspectral camera for lab, for developing the spectral libraries or classification modules, or uh, you want to develop some algorithms, you can do it with the lab data. And uh, same thing, I have uh, another set of data, which is also another set of vegetables, I think. Uh, yeah, I can open this. Uh, we have uh, vegetables one. It's also another set of data. Since because uh, we, have to, we have to work for a very close object and for a very close this one angle. So we cannot capture the complete image of our, all your vegetables. So we did part by part. So first part, then second part, third part like this. So this is another set of vegetables we had. Yeah. And it all looks same, almost like green. The broad beans, the thick, thin beans, chilies, everything. But once we go for a spectral classification, you can see there's some differences between your spectral data. So once I try to classify it, you can see that it has picked only the beans, which is of same thing, species but not the chilies, even though the color looks similar, but it has not picked the chilies. So that is the spectral signature and that is the power of your hyperspectral data so that you can classify exactly what is that in the field. Once, if you don't know anything about that, you can easily classify it. And also you were, uh, you were a different object, for example, the tomato, I think, yeah. So it won't match the spectral signature, to any other feature in that. So it exactly matches only with your tomato and wherever the tomato is available, it is going to pick that in your scene. So that is one of the power of your hyperspectral imager. We can also open the field data, the same hyperspectral imager. We have mounted it uh, in a camera like this and uh, we scanned it in front of it and we can capture the scene. And uh, maybe uh, 2015 or 16, something, we had a meeting at uh, Nax Complex and a similar meeting. So I kept the camera and the drone just outside the auditorium and we have scanned the scene in front of the auditorium. So I can just show you the data. It is called the NISA program, during the NISA program. 
Yeah, so this is what the data is. Uh, yeah, 20? 20? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is this is how you can capture the scene data. We are not flying, we have just put the camera on the drone on the rotation stage and we have captured the scene in front of us. And you will get a lot of spectral information from this, same like uh, wherever uh, you want to classify it or wherever you want to match the spectral signatures, you can do that. Uh, because of this lighting, you are not able to see. Yeah, so, yeah, okay, yeah. So this is a raw data. So you can see that this is your vegetation data. This is your uh, walls. This is your metal, uh, I mean the lamps. So everything looks different, your spectral signatures. So that is what the information you get from your field data. So once you know how to collect the data in the lab, once you know how to collect the data in the field, then you can go for flying. You can put it in a drone, you can fly. Then the data will be much more useful for you and much more uh, you'll have, you can cover vast area when you are going to use it in the drone and all those things. So that is the power of our hyperspectral imager since it's a push broom technology and also it is a concentric of spectrograph design. So it's very compact, very small. So this is the latest version of the nano imager we have, uh, which is something like uh, uh, less than one kilogram. And uh, it has the camera inside and uh, 480 GB solid state uh, drive to store the data. And also it has a internal GPS IMU, a very high performance GPS IMU and uh, all the electronics, everything is inside. So it's all comes with one piece and uh, you can just integrate it with a camera and you can fly or you can put it in a, uh, in a tripod rotation stage, you can scan it or you can put it in for the lab and you can do these applications. But typically for lab and for outdoor application, your GPS IMU is not required because your camera is stationary. It is not going to move. The camera is not going to fly. So we have a different configuration. But the technology is same. We removed the camera from this. We don't want a solid state drive. We don't want a GPS IMU. We don't want any, this one, the enclosures for drone applications. So we put the camera alone. We take out the camera alone. And that is what we have here. So that is something like less than maybe 500 grams, the camera. So that is sufficient for your lab and outdoor applications. So you can use it in a tripod stage. You can use an artificial light source. You can illuminate it and then you can start capturing the data. So it all depends upon how you are going to use the imager. Lab, field, drone, or in all the three, that is where your accessories comes in. Okay, so we also have another data set, which is from uh, Anand Agriculture University, uh, where uh, we have uh, using this uh, hyperspectral imager by Space Application Center. And uh, they do go periodically for their field like uh, AI does. They capture the data. They don't fly, but they use the tripod rotation stage and they capture the data. And uh, this is how the data looks like. But they have a very small bands, less than 100 bands. And this is what the data looks like. So you remember yesterday in our field, we have put the tarp three meter by three meter when we are flying, because we are flying at a 30 meter height. So we want to have more pixels, the reference pixels. So we kept the tarp three meter by three meter, but for a, for a distance, which is uh, for tripod rotation stage, typically we don't need a three meter by three meter tarp because our area coverage itself is less. So we use a small panel, even yesterday we used it, the small 10 by 10 inch white reference panel as a scene white reference. And uh, we convert that into 100% reflectance and the rest of the pixels are calculated as per this one. So we put this reference in the scene itself. So that is, sorry, that is, that is how we collect the data in the field. So this also looks like a, a, a good spectral information. You'll get it. Yeah, oh, sorry. Okay, so this is your vegetation and this is your soil and uh, this is your panel. So you can get a three different uh, spectral signatures from three different targets. And if you want, you can also classify it. Say, for example, if I want to classify the soils, you can find out wherever the soils are available, exposed, not the vegetation. So it has seen only the soils exposed in your sea. Similarly, the vegetation or similarly, whichever objects. And if you have a very specific, very precise spectral information, you know that, then you can easily classify which is having a stress, which is healthy, which is having nutrition stress, something like that based on this spectral data. So you don't need to go for a, a full-fledged processing and all. Quickly in the field, 
as soon as you capture the data, you will get the information. You can do some uh, uh, a quick decision. You can make it from the data. So that is what it is. And uh, this is another set of data, same field, same data, same thing. But certainly, I don't know the difference because everything looks same for me. Uh, but they do a lot of experiments, two, three, four, on periodically they visit and they collect the data. So this is also another same set of data. But this is of something like a, a, a 100 bands, spectral bands, whereas the one latest we have is something like 300 bands. So you will have much more information from this spectral data. Okay, so this is what I just want to uh, give you an introduction for lab and also for outdoor applications. So, so that you can think about your application and you can process this data. Okay. Okay, thank you. So if you have any uh, questions or doubts, uh, you can always discuss with us. And uh, we are going to set up a small uh, experiment so that everybody can have a look. Uh, yeah, in fact, I, I forgot to show you. Uh, I think on Friday or Thursday, we are here and uh, we are preparing our imager for uh, this workshop. So we one of the exercises to adjust the focus of your lens. So that we did not, uh, that we did, that, that we did not show it uh, during our uh, field campaigning, field data collection, because already we have adjusted the focus. So typically for lab applications, uh, we have a target card of a known spec, of a known, uh, uh, for example, uh, straight lines of known spacings, known thickness of the line, and we keep in front of the camera and we adjust the focus so that it is very crisp and you are able to count the lines very precisely. For the field data, because our target is something like 30 meter or 40 meter or 20 meter away, so we put the camera outside and we focus it to the far off object, like a trees or some, some known objects. Basically, we should have a good contrast, dark and bright. Then only my camera can resolve properly. So I adjust the focus and I fix it. So this is what we call as a focus adjustment. That is a part of your exercise uh, when you collect the data. So like that we did on Thursday to make the focus proper and uh, using a gimbal, we are doing it. And also using the same gimbal, we captured the images of us. And uh, it looks very, this one, uh, spectral view. So the data is, uh, okay. So this is what the image is. So with a, with a, with a far off object, uh, we have uh, adjusted the focus and in front of that, we, we were sitting and we tried to capture our image. And uh, it's on, it is on the top of this auditorium, above this terrace, we have captured it using a gimbal. We don't know what is the speed, what is the angle we have to move and all, but still we just want to have a fun on this hyperspectral data. So this is what your RGB data, sorry, your uh, JPG of your data looks like. But if you go for the spectral data, I can choose RGB bands and I can open it to make it fast. Yeah, so the data looks like this. Sorry. So this is what your spectral data of, uh, uh, for example, uh, for example, uh, we know that uh, this is uh, a skin. Okay, we will just go there and we try to classify it. Yeah, so it has classified all your skins, not your uh, costumes, I mean, uh, not your dress fabrics and all, but it has tried to classify your faces, wherever the skin got exposed. We can know that uh, where it is. And similarly, if you want to classify it much more better uh, to say that, uh, for example, if you want to match these fabrics, you can see that it has perfectly matched the fabrics wherever uh, it is available. So you can also do this uh, for, a, for a camouflaging application for defense and all. So if you want to cover something, a known installation or something with a different material, you can easily spectrally resolve it. And you can see that whether it is a true one or whether it is masked, whether it is a true reflectance of the leaf or whether it is a artificial leaf or artificial plant. Reflectance of the whole road six, we can easily classify it. Yeah. Yeah, so this is our data, sir. Yes, not seen it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for example, yeah, 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 yeah. 
<laughs> so this is uh, we have taken it. Uh, so that's why we have kept him in the center uh, with a white shirt as a reference, white reference. That's also a nice example of uh, distortion. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't know whether it will match spectrally. Uh, it should not saturate. Your your pixels must not saturate. That is very important. Yeah, yeah. It's not saturating. I think. I selected three bands. Oh yeah, it is saturating. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll just close this and open with uh, all bands. I can I can I can select the required bands. And also, I can select the uh, spatial. Also, I can I can select whatever I want. For example, I don't want uh, uh, the complete uh, spatial. Okay. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> that's another. That's another field data. Yeah. Okay. So it is in a grouping, group image. Okay. Okay, so you want to see the spectral data of uh, uh, ST. Oh, okay, it's not mass saturating. Yeah, good. No, oh, it's saturating. That will definitely saturate. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But his shirt looks very good. I mean, uh, sunny. sunny. Yeah. Sunny. Yeah. Uh, this one, and this is colorful. So you can see the lot of difference here. One, two, different. Uh, this one. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, okay. I don't have that another image. I think. Uh, yeah, say for example, she is wearing a. Yeah, Shalini, Dr. Shalini is wearing a red. Uh, this one, and it can match only with the red, wherever the reds are exposed. That fabric is totally different. Uh, even though we have other red or other things available, it doesn't match with this. So it's a nice example of how complex it is to find the proper speed yeah. for such a target because we have close things with a bigger pixel. Farther things with a smaller pixel, so yeah. you have to decide what matters to you in this. Yeah, whereas this red, if I cast classify it, yeah, yeah, see, see the interesting anybody? See, there are two pairs, but they're not matching. Yeah, even though the visibly it looks visible, they look same, same red, maybe same. you both of you. <laughs> so, both of you are wearing red, but uh, yeah. So that is the power of your hyperspectral imaging. That is what you have been discussing for the last 10 days, I think, more than uh, this one. So you Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah, but uh, it's raw data. Yeah, it's a raw data. I have not made any con conversions. It, will, it is going to match with uh, wherever the, yeah, whoever is matching. Yeah, certain portion. But yeah, we can, we can adjust this. Yeah, once we have a perfect data, it's it's not a. I, I will not say this is a perfect data because just we are adjusting the focus and we are playing with the camera. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have another image with both of you. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Another interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, yeah. The, the nice thing could be that uh, we show you. Let's not see. Uh, no, no, it's not there. Okay. Yeah. The, so. Oops, sorry. Ah. I put it. <laughs> okay. Using this uh, spectrometer, which is basically the same camera. <laughs> We, we, I brought this little spectrometer, which is substantially the nano without the GPS and without the shell, but still operational. Uh, yeah, but I need, uh, I think I would be easier on this table. So I, I don't know how I may connect this to here. We, you can team viewer me if you want. You want to team viewer me? And you, uh, or is if the HDMI is long enough? Uh, 
I can come as close as I can. I can move everything here. Okay, just as a little, little background, um, Hegel has uh, recently been acquired by a capital investment company called Arsenal Capital, a New York based company. And uh, without making too long story, Hegel has recently acquired another great company from the Netherlands called Perclas, developing Mira, one of the most common uh, softwares for uh, uh, hyperspectral data analysis in industry is not common in remote sensing, but it's extremely common whenever the, the, the camera is used in, uh, for example, in the controlled environment in lab, because it's got a powerful classifier engine, which we're not necessarily using today, um, but um, <coughs> Mira is now basically taking control of every machine vision camera, industrial camera we are offering to the market. Therefore, it's extremely handy uh, for me to use this tool uh, to show you the, the feature of the system. The, um, in this case, we are like simulating a lab condition. So we are illuminating uh, uh, a, a scene and uh, um, we are trying to play with some features of the camera. The main one, being uh, the focus, the focus adjustment. That's truly an important, to, uh, important thing to manage. So we are showing you how to adjust the, uh, the, the, the focus of this camera. Have you seen that? Do you remember the tools that I showed you before? Yeah. The camera is focused to infinity when we work uh, in, uh, from a drone perspective. But when you work close, every, slight change of distance requires an adaptation in focus and again comes into play the f number that helps with the aperture and uh, with the um uh, with the depth of focus just for the just for the records this camera has an f 2.5 uh, f number all right so I, one thing I can do, uh, if you have just a white sheet of paper, that would be sufficient for the purpose. Thanks a lot. Is to, well, do you have also the, the calibration chart, the focus chart? I can use anything, but if you have the focus chart with the lines, okay. Yes, if you don't mind. Okay, so let's first mm -hmm, optimize the, the camera. This is not an optimized setup, but it should work. It's not excessively bad. Let me adjust. Okay, now the center of the bulb, let's make it a bit more diffuse. So I am trying to operate with a diffused illuminator, which requires potentially to be standing higher because it's a spotty light. And this means that I have to make it as diffuse as possible instead of being pointing at a specific point in order to cover the largest uh, of my field of views. Not too bad. I still have some uh, darkest area, but <clears throat> it's fine for 
for the purpose now. So um, this is the live stream of the camera. It's still a pool room camera, so don't be, don't think this is an image on its own. It's composed line by line in time. It's like we were flying, right? It's like being uh, being flying. The um, the, the thing to adjust here yeah, is the exposure. So if you if I adjust for a, a higher exposure time, my image is just looking looking brighter. It's just looking brighter. So for example, if I acquire a test without any without any 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 kind of uh, optimization first. I take just a few lines to see how I'm doing with my light. And I look at the spectra. Yeah, I have to stop the camera first. Okay. You can see that this in this condition I am terribly, not so terribly, but quite largely Is that an LED, Pimen? Is that an LED or a halogen? No. Halogen. All right. Okay. But it looks quite okay. Okay, I'm a bit surprised by the shape actually, but. Initialize the camera again. Okay, let's go back to our fifty. So until I find another okay, the slit is like this. Yes, the system has to be like this. Okay, so here I am. When I find my proper, when I find my proper illumination settings, we will look at some samples um, first. Until I find my my illumination settings, I um, can actually now I have to play now with the focus. And when I'm in close focus, in close distance with the sample, a lot of uh, useful uh, accessories come into play. This is just an example of a focusing object. So with a lot of lines that I have to focus as better as I can wait until I, I find the proper, the proper focus. The, the thing to do is quite easy when you are in lab, not so easy when you are outdoor, is to release this color a little bit and turning the lens until my focus improves. Okay, now they are. It's getting better, you see? It's getting more, yeah, more focused. It's it's focus. Yeah, let's leave it alone for a moment. So once you don't move the camera, the object, it is going to see the same. The same line all the time. It's getting better. Yeah. We it's still good. can improve that. Mm-hmm, a bit more. This creepy sound. <laughs> so once after finishing this- uh, Okay, I did, I did worse now. I didn't go, I did too much maybe. Yeah. I have to return to where I was. So once you go beyond your focus, then it will become blurred. Mm, so blurred again. Find out the exact position and you have to see it. Yeah, I think this is quite- Quite nice. Let's let let the image run a bit. 
You see, it's always the same image because the camera is not moving. I see always the same line. Okay, now I can seal the, the, the color and they know that, that for this distance, for this lens, I am properly uh, focusing. Okay, so recording a now recording a um, a sample is quite easy. You just need some way, some means of moving the camera. This is not any kind of official official headwall equipment in regards to the tripod and the moving stage. Just something that comes handy in terms of uh, making quick demonstrations. We can try, for example, with this leaf. Okay, let's make sure that it's in focus. Again, it's nothing that looks like a leaf because we are not uh, moving that. Uh, yes, as soon as I start moving, the scan takes place. Quick scan again. It's going probably a bit too fast. Nevertheless, here we are with our with our image. It's not too shaky, so the system is not ideal, but still decent for a a quick a quick image. The um, the distortions given by rotating are definitely larger than the ones by by moving the sensor always nadir and that's how most typically cameras are mounted they look down because of course the pixels projected uh, here from us from a side lateral view are different from the pixels projected uh, laterally but this is still good as i said for for a for a demo i hope you like it Let's take another run. Okay, before we decide we are happy with the setup and we can save some data. Yeah. I don't want to make it too, run, too long run. Okay, I'm taking something that is dirt, something that is not healthy. It's also interesting. We can also take a larger view if you want, if we want. However, let's do it like that. Yeah, as you can see, not everything is exactly at the same height, but we are still within the depth of focus of the lens, I believe. Yeah, everything remains nicely in uh, nicely in focus. Why is it gray? Very simply because it's monoband. I'm watching that. Uh, a band uh, in between. This is not wavelength. This is just the number of band, then band, the band number. So I'm I'm just uh, focusing in the center. This uh, this has 300 bands. So I'm looking at in this at the center band of my of my wavelength range, and it's black because I'm watching, and it's grayscaled just because I'm watching at one single band. Let's put something colored as well. Thanks, Piman, for bringing.
When the sample is finished, I'm just finishing the recording. We can put it a bit more. Uh, if, I, if I don't see, if I'm not seeing the bottom of this guy here, it's gonna go like more up like this. White, remember the white, but we can move the sample. Yeah, it should be quite okay. We can try another test again. They are more in the center. Okay, this this is this can stay on. We are just making a quick test, but this is a nice example of what not to do when you measure indoor, because this light is is different from this light, and uh, it's got an influence on the illumination curve. You may say, okay, I keep it on. I have a white reference, I eliminate the inference. Yes and no, because the characteristics of this light, like most of the lights in our offices, is that it's AC powered. It's the power, the, the illumination it emits is fluctuating and it's very hard to correct for that. This camera has a more stable power, but it's good that we have this nice <laughs> non-wanted example. Yes. Okay. Now flowers. Looks quite dark. It's saying this light. Are you sure it's say? Yeah, I still I see the colors, but I just have a trouble with uh, getting light in the middle. Okay. It looks like it's pretty shifted to the right side. Mm -hmm. I don't see why, because the, the waterfall looks okay. I mean, yes. It's 
linear TV looks fine. This looks like super fit in the infrared. But yeah, nevertheless, this is part we are not using. Don't look at this. So yeah. typically for the lab setup, uh, this is what we do. First, we take and a dark reference. Uh, that is, we close the camera and okay. we record the data. And then we put the white reference, which is 100% reflectance material, and we take the white data. Okay. Then no, we put the targets one by one, and then we can start capturing the data. So this is a sequence. Uh, this, just for a demonstration purpose, we are doing it very manually. Okay. But okay. Uh, it is a programmable, so we can do it in an in a automated way. So that's the user no need to do this. This is yeah. the red part. So the red the visible, the red, the red band is here. So that's red. That's how it, that's why it's peak. I was for, for a moment a bit perplexed because I forgot that this has a lot of emission towards the the infrared compared yeah. to the sun, which is much more peaks yeah. towards the visible. That's yeah. why I was initially puzzled with that. And uh, this is green, so the peak of emission of reflectance is with the green. We don't have any blue objects, but this is more or less exactly how it should look like. So the next thing we can do, we, and uh, we can do it uh, uh, directly quite quickly, is to convert this data to reflectance, so compensate for this illumination. But basically, already in the raw data, you see uh, how, how the, uh, the information looks like. It's always good to have some white pixels in the scene, because pretty much as we did for, uh, for the um, start, when we flew, we can always use some scene one reference to compensate for the status of light. The, um, the message is that you have to be careful with illumination, but you also have to be careful with, with focus. As you can see, it's extremely important uh, to have a good focus. The other thing that is critical for that I want to show that is critical for uh, um, for hypers for, for push broom is the uh, stability. I want to show you what I mean, just very quickly. This looks like, hopefully this looks like a stable image, but little effects, yeah. little, little variation Vibration. or, or shape. Uh, this is exaggerated, of course, but even little um, instability of the scene gives you, gives you problems. So the system should not be installed, for example, on a, on a bench which is not stable, is subject to vibrations. I've been to places, to industries where the, 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 the floor shakes all the time, the, because they are in, we are in the lab and the production is just through, out, out, of, uh, out of the window and the entire, the entire system shakes. And all my images are looking like, looking like this. So it's very important to have a stable, a stable uh, solution. But hopefully this gives you a hint of what it means to measure push room because it's not it's maybe more intuitive to look at it from a lab perspective than from a field one. Yeah. Yep. Well, if you want, we can send you the, the spectra just for your <laughs> review when we elaborate them. Okay. So they deserve lunch. <laughs> yeah. So let's just come on to the okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So maybe uh, we'll go for a lunch and then uh, we'll assemble it quickly. Close it. Thanks. That was nice. Yeah. Mm. <laughs>
and that includes things like uh, tillage uh, practices, applications. Hello, my name is Melba Crawford, and I'm from Purdue. Hello, my name is Melba Crawford, and I'm from Purdue University. And I'm delighted to be able to share with you some of the research that has been ongoing here at Purdue. It's related to multimodality remote sensing in high throughput phenotyping of row crops. And I'll talk about various aspects of data acquisition, processing, and predictive modeling. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with phenotyping, first, let me talk a bit about the key applications. Two of them include plant breeding, where um, candidate genes are produced and then the best needs to be selected, etc.
that it is not going to tell the patient and the board to introduce the uh, respected speaker for the medical process. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon to all of you, all the trainees who are uh, present offline and online, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rabin Narayan Sagu and uh, uh, Dr. Francisco and Prusotam from Hedwal Photonics, and uh, my colleagues, and Professor Milba Crawford in absentia. So, uh, good afternoon to all of you. It is indeed uh, my great pleasure uh, to invite you uh, to all for this important lecture uh, by Professor Melba Crawford. So, I would like to uh, briefly introduce uh, uh, Professor Melba Crawford uh, to uh, the participants. So, uh, Dr. Melba Crawford, uh, she is currently uh, Nancy uh, Muridil and Francis uh, was Professor of Civil Engineering at uh, uh, Laila School of Civil Engineering and uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue University. Uh, Dr. Um, Melba Crawford, uh, she has done her uh, undergraduation and uh, from University of Illinois in engineering and also post-graduation at uni from University of Illinois uh, en at en engineering di di discipline in 1973. And then she has obtained her uh, PhD degree from Ogier State University in 1981. Since then, she is uh, serving various uh, positions. Before uh, joining uh, University of Purdue, she was uh, an, uh, an engineering uh, foundation endowed professor at the University of Texas, Austin, where she founded uh, an interdisciplinary research and application and development program in space-based and airborne remote sensing. Her research interests in, include classification and prediction of high dimensional data with a focus on hyperspectral, lidar sensing, data fusion, and knowledge transformation, adaptation for generalization, and as well as application for those methods to the agriculture and natural resource mapping and monitoring. Uh, she is currently uh, leading several uh, projects. Uh, so some of them I would like to uh, tell you, which is uh, relevant to uh, the current training program also. Uh, recently, uh, she has completed uh, a project funded by the Department of Energy, Advanced Research Project uh, Agency of Energy uh, by USC on uh, the automated uh, sorghum phenotyping and, and uh, trade development platform. And uh, currently, uh, she is also coordinating another project on uh, from the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research Funded Project on an open source framework and community for sharing data and algorithm. And uh, an international project uh, from the uh, CIMIT uh, she is currently uh, doing, which is on the heat stress resilient maize for South Asia through public private partnership and a project on automated sorghum phenotyping and, and trade development uh, platform. In addition to that, uh, she has a lot of expertise in uh, various uh, the uh, remote sensing applications, especially hyperspectral and uh, LIDAR uh, sensing applications in agriculture. And uh, to her uh, credit, uh, she has a lot of uh, awards. Some of them I would like to uh, mention. Uh, as she, uh, a, is a teacher and researcher for excellence. Uh, to recognizing this contribution, she has been uh, awarded Outstanding Graduate Faculty Award, uh, Graduate School University of uh, Texas, and uh, NASA Outstanding uh, Service Award uh, in 2002, uh, Jefferson uh, Senior Science Fellow, US uh, State Department in 2005, and Purdue Chair of Excellence in Earth Observation from 2006 to 2019. And then she uh, joined as the Nancy Urdil and Francis uh, Basu uh, Professor in Civil Engineering in 2019. Uh, she is also uh, the uh, uh, received uh, IEEE uh, Gross Outstanding uh, Service Award in 2020. Uh, Dr. Crawford is a fellow of uh, IEEE and past president of uh, IEEE Geoscience and uh, Re Remote Sensing Society. And uh, currently, she is a treasurer of IEEE and Technical Advisory Board. And she was also a member of uh, uh, NASA uh, Service Validation Team and served the NASA Earth System Sciences and Application Advisory Committee. And she is also in the Advisory Committee uh, to the NASA uh, Socioeconomic Applications and uh, Data Center. 
So with this uh, uh, brief uh, uh, introduction about uh, 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 Dr. Melba Crawford, uh, I invite you all for uh, the lecture, which will be uh, played now on the multimodality remote sensing in high throughput phenotyping of row crops, data acquisition, processing, and predictive modeling. Thank you all for uh, joining this lecture. Hello, my name is Melba Crawford and I'm from Purdue University and I'm delighted to be able to share with you some of the research that has been on a few um, examples. So these are four years. And Hello, my name is Melba Crawford and I'm from Purdue University and I'm delighted to be able to share with you some of the research that has been ongoing here at Purdue it's related to multi or um, the flowering date. Um, hello, my name is Melba Crawford and I'm from Purdue University and I'm. Hello, my name is Melba Crawford and I'm from Purdue University and I'm delighted to be able to share with you some of the research that has been ongoing here at Purdue. It's related. to multimodality remote sensing in high throughput phenotyping of row crop. Hello, my name is Melba Crawford and I'm from Purdue University and I'm delighted to be able to share with you some of the research that has been ongoing here at Purdue it's related to multimodality remote sensing in high throughput phenotyping of row crops. And I'll talk about various aspects of data acquisition. Hello, my name is Melba Crawford and I'm from Purdue University and I'm delighted to be able to share with you some of the Hello, my name is Melba Crawford and I'm from Purdue University and I'm delighted to be able to share with you some of the research that has been ongoing here at Purdue. It's related to multimodality remote sensing in high throughput phenotyping of row crops. And I'll talk about various aspects of data acquisition, processing and predictive modeling. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with phenotyping, first, let me talk a bit about the key applications. Two of them include plant breeding, where um, candidate genotypes are produced and then the best needs to be selected. Studies of management practices also utilize phenotyping, and that includes things like uh, tillage uh, practices, 
application of nitrogen, and that would be both the timing and the quantity. Now the phenotype itself is comprised of the outcome of the genotype, the environment, and the management practices. So it's a measurable characteristic or trait of a plant, such as height, for example. Now traditionally, it's measured directly. And so this frequently involves destructive sampling, which is expensive and time consuming. <laughs> Now, the genome can be sequenced relatively inexpensively and quickly, so this is the current bottleneck in some of these applications. Now, just as an example, we had a project related to phenotyping sorghum, and sorghum was an energy crop. So, on the left, you see several agronomic traits that are of interest, for example, um, you know, for the sorghum, it might include the plant stand, number of tillers, the height, etc. Physiological traits and composition traits. Now, there are several opportunities for remote sensing to contribute to this. And um, in terms of replacing measurements that might be made manually and providing additional inputs for model-based phenotyping. And several of those are listed here, including things like plant counts, um, plant height, you might have leaf area index or um, the flowering date, um, canopy temperature, canopy cover, etc. Advances in phenotyping have been going on for several years, and they are, include both uh, controlled facilities and field-based phenotyping. So on the left, what you see is a controlled facility. And in the middle, you will see remotely sensed data that are being acquired in the field. Now it's at multiple scales, could be from wheeled vehicles, UAVs, manned aircraft, spacecraft. The output of these sensors in general is going to be some form of imagery that represents characteristics. For example, output of RGB cameras, you might have heights from LIDAR, you might have spectral information from the Wiener and or the SWIR, uh, thermal data, etc. Now, in indoor phenotyping, there are both advantages and challenges, as you can see here on the right. So with a controlled facility, then you'll have repeatable environments and conditions, and you can actually control those. You have extremely high resolution data from multiple sensors typically. It's stable. You don't have any problems with the um, platform characteristics and its geometry. On the other hand, the environment really cannot emulate natural conditions. Um, Pots are not the same as being in plots. And it's expensive, and you can only have a limited number of samples. In the field, then, the opportunities and challenges are different. Of course, this is a natural, uncontrolled environment. It covers multiple um, areas, typically, uh, that are extended, but you have limited temporal uh, replications in terms of being able to cover the whole area. Operationally, the weather impacts what you can do. From a remote sensing data point of view and or field-based phenotyping, then typically there's extensive processing that's required. From remote sensing, you would have large numbers of samples, but the reference data that it would be utilized would typically be limited, and that would have to come, of course, from the field measurements or annotation of the imagery. So there are great opportunities, actually, from the point of view of machine learning to actually utilize the remotely sensed data, exploit it, and leverage the issues associated with, um, with data, mitigate the limited quantities of data, and uh, produce uh, products that are extremely useful. Now, when I talk about multimodality sensing, then you know we really need to think about multi in sort of ways. The modality piece up here is you know multiple sensors, 
and that's primarily the focus of my work here and it will be for the field now we also need to think in terms of the platform which could be as i said wheeled or it could be uh, airborne of some form now this workshop is related to airborne sensing so i'll focus on that you can also have multiple scale because you could have airborne data that would be from a uav and or a manned aircraft and or space in this presentation i'll focus on uavs and then in terms of time you know depending on the phenomena then the scale of time that you need data differs sometimes multiple acquisitions per day perhaps for thermal um, multiple acquisitions over the growing season uh, or perhaps just early and late stage acquisitions. It really depends on what you're trying to do. Now, for our work, the candidate sensors that we have been using that I'll talk about today include RGB. So it's a, where you happen to be using a Sony camera, LiDAR, and uh, some of the data are acquired from a VLP-16, uh, the others from a VLP-32. Of course, Velodyne is the vendor. And the hyperspectral data on this platform comes from the uh, Headwall Nano Hyperspec. We have other experiments where we use both the Wiener and the Swear. And then we use an APX um, um, in this case, it's a UAV 15 version two uh, for positioning. And we want to have positioning within two to five centimeters. And you'll understand why this is so critical uh, in a couple of slides. All right, so let me just show, first of all, here on the upper right, one of the first things that one needs to do. You know, we're typically working in a plot environment and we need to extract the rows so that we can do analysis on the individual rows and whatever um, has been done with these rows, whether it's destructive sampling or other kinds of measurements. In this particular case, you'll see a 12 row plot and we have algorithms for extracting that automatically. And then what we do is throughout the season, then we utilize um, repeated measurements over these, and they are showing here, individual rows. Now to do this, you can either use um, field-based targets for processing your data. In our case, we are um, using system calibration that is achieved prior to the uh, flying. We do it uh, typically once a season. Um, the only thing on the sys platform that knows where it is and where it's looking is really the GNSS INS system. And so everything, so it's mapped to a common mapping frame, but everything on board is mapped geometrically to it. So we don't need to fly with targets. So I'll start first with RGB based products, which are important um, because of their high resolution. So early season, then many times people are interested in plant counts, not only how many, but their localization, where they are. Um, we have used many uh, approaches, and the one that we find most successful is based on a simple deep learning um, method that only uses annotation of the center of the plant. Now, this is particularly useful for maize and for sorghum, not so um, useful for plants that are very, very dense, such as uh, soybeans, for example. And so one of the issues that you have is you can accomplish your goal for a given field. You can acquire reference data. You can run your algorithm and get good results. But when you try to apply that in another location, which might have somewhat different characteristics, and these are referred to as acre and Wabash, um, you see that there's a difference here. This happens to be in terms of the background of the tillage experiment uh, process. And so you need to update the algorithm. Classical methods are not very good at this. And so this is, happens to be one of the uh, strengths associated with deep learning. You can update many times with what's called few shot learning. So you only need to do a limited amount of updating with additional annotation in another site. 
And just to show you an example, then what we have here is a particular row, and this is where we trained on 600 acre images, and then we blindly predicted on this Wabash site. Now, if you look here, the ground reference data is red, and the true positives are yellow, so you would want them to align, and they do pretty well. On the other hand, the uh, false positives are blue, and the false negatives are cyan, and you see a number of those. Now, after updating, with few shot learning, then you see there's a significant improvement. And you can see that in terms of the numbers here where the um, metrics are, you know, precision and recall, accuracy, the RMSE in terms of locating the plant where it really is, and then the score. So if we were to compare this to uh, RetinaNet, which was an earlier version of um, uh, deep learning that has been widely used, then what you see in this blind application, the accuracy is only about 10%, whereas with CenterNet, the algorithm did better, all right, it was 85%, neither of which is as good as what you could get uh, in, in terms of your uh, original data if you were to train and test it both there. But this is about the transfer learning. Then with CenterNet, which has been updated, you see you go from about 86% to about 91% in terms of accuracy. And you also improve the RMSE. So this is just an example of use of RGB imagery. Now, where you're detecting objects, then um, in terms of row crops with sorghum, then you might want to count panicles as well, or you might want to count um, and detect tassels in maize. And so I show you a couple of examples of both of these. Now people are interested in tassels and panicles because of flowering. And so when 50% of the uh, plants are 50% flowered, then we say flowering occurs. And so you see this sequence here of dates, and then the, um, the ground reference is uh, indicated with the red dots. I hope you can see them. And the center retinet results are the blue uh, that are on top of them. So there are a few mistakes, and in, but early in the season, you have very few. And then of course, as it progresses, then you have full flowering. So what we see here, is again the corresponding red is the reference and um, what we do with CenterNet is the dot of blue and you see it follows pretty closely in terms of the um the, the counts and the actual flowering date was 713 and so that fits really pretty well with where the 50 percent occurs and this is another example now the annotation for the maze that wasn't used initially in that experiment was point annotation, it could have been box annotation, which is also widely used. And so for sorghum, then this is just another example where we're showing the uh, flowering curve and it happens to use a different algorithm, uh, which is a version of YOLO V5. So RGB is of course just one uh, form of sensing. LiDAR is gaining popularity. And um, the first thing it's typically used for is the uh, determination of the terrain model, which is shown over here. So the data would be acquired for that, typically early season, and then would be utilized uh, to determine the actual plant heights. Um, now, there's a question about what the plant height might be in terms of LIDAR, because the point cloud um, is going to also pick up and be noisy at the top of the plant. And so you need to typically do correlation and about 95% turns out to be the 95 percentile for height turns out to be a good um, measurement that re relates very well to field measurements in terms of what is used uh, as a top collar measurement, for example. Um, and so what you do is you then utilize that to track the structure throughout the growing season. And so what you see here, and it's shown in low to high on this color bar, that the uh, different plots, which are associated with different genotypes uh, throughout the season, grow at different rates. Now, what you'll see in here with these uh, dark blue uh, lines is really where the destructive sampling has occurred. Now, other information can also be obtained um, that is related to the horizontal distribution, for example, of the plant. 
Uh, you can get canopy cover from it. You could get volume, which you cannot do uh, from passive optical. Various kinds of indices can also be uh, computed, and it can be utilized potentially for uh, determining leaf area index. Now, as we move to multi-sensor prediction, then um, we have, again, the opportunity to bring in other kinds of information. We really haven't brought in chemistry at all, which is, of course, what the hyperspectral data provides. These are complex relationships, though, and you would really like them to be representative of the physiological state of the, uh, the crop. Uh, just to look at some of the mathematical issues, you know, these relationships are nonlinear. When we talk about features, they can either be, we call them handcrafted, such as an index, um, or they may be derived as encoded features from the data. Um, and so the biomass in this particular case, which is the outcome, you can just imagine the inputs that related to the outputs uh, will vary throughout the season and that they will be uh, complex. So that's um, you know, something that one needs to try to take into account in some sort of a multi-temporal model, potentially. Now, when we talked about limited reference samples previously, our problem was not as great as it is now, because with multiple sensors, then you have to have even more um, data in terms of the reference data for each of the sensors, but typically to build a complex model overall, you're going to need more reference data. So the various strategies just are shown here in a very simple way. So historically, then there's been the field plants, and so then there's machine uh, harvesting. So if you want to know the biomass, you would do that at multiple times of the season, and then you would have your output. Now, over here in the middle column, we have remotely sensed data, and I call it image data, although it could also include um, LIDAR, for example. And in this large category of empirical models, I just refer to them in large as regression models, and so these inputs would then be mapped to the biomass. Now, there's something else that we haven't talked about, and that's the mechanistic or process models. And one such model that is used widely for sorghum happens to be APSOM. Another that is used for crops is DSAT, and there are others. So these are simulation models. People are beginning to use remote sensing data a bit to try to determine the parameters for these models. And then these models with uh, multiple conditions in terms of historical uh, weather, in terms of various soil characteristics. I'll talk about in this um, presentation though, is really the middle column, which are the empirical models. So to combine all these features, then, you know, just to show you what the possibilities are, uh, we have genetics and the genetic markers, there's about 80,000 of these in this particular problem. So that's pretty high dimensional. And there are various ways of reducing this. The most common is to use uh, principal components or wavelets so that you would have features that would be derived. RGB features could be uh, canopy cover, there could be leaf counts if you're flying low enough or you have some sort of ground-based uh, input, panicle counts for sorghum, for example. Now in hyperspectral data, then what you can get is multiple kinds of reflectance information. There are hundreds of bands in these sense, uh, that are sensed by these sensors, as you know. Either the data itself can be utilized or various Vegetation indices can be um, derived, they can be computed. You can integrate over various parts of the spectrum or take derivatives to create additional features. So there's just a wide range of information that's chemistry-based that can come from the hyperspectral data. And then I've already mentioned several of the kinds of features that can be derived from LIDAR. 
So we have used both classical approaches, which um, I would refer to as machine learning, um, which include models that would be um, PLSR based, support vector regression um, for prediction of yield in a given year. In deep learning, we are found that recurrent neural networks are, are quite useful because you can input the, in the data um, at multiple uh, phenology, phenology, times of phenology of the plants that are important. And you can also incorporate, as you could in the classical machine learning models, weather data, you could have soils data. In our case, then what we are using is precipitation. Um, we're using growing degree days, that's essentially the same as temperature that is going to be um, after the plant uh, emerges, after it's been planted, and, um, and solar radiation. And then we have our remotely sensed data from RGB, from, um, in this case it's the hyperspectral and the LIDAR. The RGB is not used in this particular model. So you would have the progression throughout the season, and then uh, the output would then be the combined uh, the biomass. So just to show you a few um, examples. So these are four years. And you can see now this R squared value is not a traditional R squared value where you're really essentially determining um, whether it can be fit by a linear uh, trend, but it's comparing it to the specific one to one. All right. So it's more, uh, usually it'll be lower in general than your typical R squared. Okay, so for four years, you can see that we do pretty well. You can see that the range of the biomass differs. You have different fields, you have different weather, um, but for a given year, then you get a reasonably good fit. Now, if you were to predict, and so let's just say from 18, and you were to test on 19, so this is 18 and 19, then you see that it doesn't fit all that well. Now, if you update it, all right, uh, as I've described previously, using um, updating approaches, then uh, in, we refer to them broadly as um, domain adaptation as a part of transfer learning, then what you see when you fine tune that network is you do much better. And that is true for all of these years. So this is an example of how you might, first of all, collect data and fit a model. In the next year, if you just want to update it, you might not need as much reference data, but if you happen to have it, you can include it, and then your model just gets richer and richer over time. Now, I'm gonna show you an example as well for nitrogen practices, and so what you see here, um, you know, is a, is a plant. And uh, there's a, a typical nitrogen cycle that uh, the plants go through uh, during their um, season. And so when we look at the yield response based on nitrogen rate, then what we see is, you know, it increases rapidly, but then you saturate. And people want to know the optimum and they want to know the optimum both in terms of the total and in terms of, let's say, if they applied it once at the beginning of the season, or if they had multiple times that they were applying it throughout the season, then they would want to know what is the optimum in terms of utilization and yield. So this is a simple example that, again, here, this is on the left, uh, an image of uh, West Lafayette, where this experiment was a um, uh, conducted. And so you see the various colors associated with the plots. The colors are going to be the nitrogen rates. And um, there was only one um, variety. So we only had, you know, this one type of plant. And um, this particular year was 2021. So just to show the results, we, uh, again, this is the graphic we had before that we utilized for our deep learning for prediction associated with uh, plant breeding. But this time the inputs are different. Uh, they would include the nitrogen that would be associated with a given plot. And the information is put together at the end for a prediction 
and then uh, you see that in this case we again got a good um, prediction now one of the things that we i'm not going to show here but we have been doing in addition you know that in terms of the plant physiology that the uptake of nitrogen occurs at different rates at different points in the season and so the applications might be more important in terms of weighting uh, this is a, a model that just looks at the end product but you can add attention networks temporal attention networks and we are beginning to do that and not surprisingly we're finding that uh, just prior to flowering we find that uh, the nitrogen application is um, really important in terms of what the value had been so again coming to the end with biophysical models then uh, I just want to show you you know we say we want to integrate with these biophysical models but they have been years in development and you see quite a complex interaction here so trying to determine where you can best engage to uh, integrate and uh, update the biophysical model as well as utilize the greater extent of inputs that could be used and um, those that are really related to the plant biology and incorporate those into the empirical models through feedback loops is a complex process but it happens to be the research area that many of us are working in these days so again I just want to thank you and um, you know this overall we're remote sensing types and we tend to think that you know this is the most important thing in this process well we're a little bit up here in the northeast corner um, and we know that you know data are acquired at, from multiple platforms at multiple scales and similarly the models are at multiple scales and so the remote sensing data is of course one component associated with the model you also have in situ input that might be sensors but it might also be soils for example that are static and then all of this is combined with and incorporated to provide output that you know we really hope will have uh, impact associated with decision making and thank you so very much I wish I had been able to be there but um, if you have any questions please do not hesitate to email me and thank you so much I have a list of references here just in case you're interested and again this work was supported by the Department of Energy ARPA-E and the US uh, NSF National Science Foundation So uh, once again, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, our uh, next uh, speaker is Dr. Uh, Carson Roberts. Uh, he is a senior application engineer at Dual Photonics CDSA. Uh, Dr. Carson's uh, respons responsibilities include uh, project man management, development of algorithms, and uh, support uh, to the customers for uh, spectral imaging analysis. Dr. Carson is a scientist, engineer, and teacher with broad experience in the field of hyperspectral uh, imaging, material science, physics, process development, design, and computer uh, modeling. And uh, he has ex 
extensive experience in uh, computational neuroscience in neuroscience uh, by using metlab and uh, genesis he is an ex he is having lot of experience in managing government research uh, for uh, various uh, startup companies uh, he is specialized in optical optical engineering design and process engineering biophysical uh, computer modeling and he has specialized in linux unix system administration and uh, today uh, Dr. Um, Carson Roberts will be talking to you on the airborne, airborne imaging spectroscopy beyond the crop uh, fields. So, with this uh, brief remark, I uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Carson Roberts uh, for uh, his lecture. Thank you very much. So my name is Carson Roberts from uh, Headwall Photonics, and uh, I'll be talking today about a preliminary study we have done of harmful algal blooms on in Santuit Pond on Cape Cod on the east coast of North America. So, so talking about harmful algae blooms, I want to first describe what the problem is. And so there are elements necessary to, necessary to life. If you want to make a potato or a person, so my name is Carson Roberts from uh, Headwall Photonics, and I'll be talking today about a preliminary study we have done of harmful algal blooms on, in Santuit Pond on Cape Cod on the east coast of North America. So talking about harmful algae blooms, I want to first describe what the problem is. And so there are elements necessary to, necessary to life. If you want to make a potato or a person, the main components you need are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Carbon is important. It's the, the largest component of most living things. It combines with oxygen and hydrogen to create carbohydrates like sugars and starches and cellulose and hydrocarbons. Hydrogen and oxygen, they're in hydro hydrocarbons and carbohydrates as above. Um, and they're also in dihydrogen monoxide, which is in all cells and in all bodies of water essential to life. Nitrogen, is abundant in the atmosphere as, as the, um, the N2 molecule, but that molecule is very tightly bound. It isn't biologically available, and it has to be broken down generally into some nitrate form like ammonia, and then it is available for living cells to make amino acids, proteins, and uh, build the rest, uh, many parts of cells. And so nitrogen is very often the limiting factor in the amount of biomass that can grow in any particular environment, that's one of the reasons that nitrates are very important as fertilizers. Sulfur is also essential to life, but it's generally not a limiting reagent uh, in uh, the, the growth of a particular species. Phosphorus is also essential to all cells. All cells have a cell membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer. And if you see this picture of all these little cell uh, membranes, every single molecule, every single little ball and, and stick in that has at least one phosphorus atom in it. And so nitrogen and phosphorus are limiting reagents. More and excess of nitrogen and phosphorus in an ecosystem can lead to blooms of otherwise less abundant organisms. So the problem for particularly for the harmful algal blooms is human and agricultural waste. Now, human waste, because it takes nitrogen and phosphorus to build people, uh, we excrete them uh, in our waste. And uh, the human waste, if it gets into bodies of water, can increase the amount of, of biologically available nitrogen and phosphorus and can lead to blooms of otherwise less abundant organisms. Agricultural fertilizers. Again, you're trying to build cells. And so most agricultural fertilizers contain nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So sewage, septic systems, those can put a lot of nitrogen into the uh, atmosphere because although all the solid waste can be collected in a septic system, the nitrates and phosphates are highly soluble and they will seep through the groundwater and get into bodies of water. Runoff from over fertilized fields can also increase the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. And so combined with the fact that we've got global warming, the temperatures of bodies of water are increasing. Most things are going to grow faster when it's warmer. That combined with the runoff from human waste and from agriculture can lead to harmful algal blooms, 
where some species that are toxic can grow out of control and make an entire body of water toxic. And at the bottom, I have two pictures of our study area. Now, these are data that were taken actually with our hyperspectral systems. It's RGB images from the hyperspectral systems. On the left, you can see the pond uh, in November. On the right, you can see the pond in August. It's hard to see in November where our hyperspectral data are because they kind of match the color of the Google Maps. But you can see in August that this this the pond had turned very, very green. That is the harmful algal bloom, and that is what we are trying to measure uh, to, to see if we can detect and, qua and uh, quantify these with hyperspectral imaging. Now, describe the problem that leads to these uh, toxic algae blooms, which is too much nitrogen phosphorus coming into an ecosystem. Now, I'll talk about the culprit. They're called cyanobacteria. They're also called blue-green algae. They're not actually bacteria. They're not actually algae. Uh, they're very uh, primitive life form. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that cyanobacteria are the very first organisms, organisms to discover photosynthesis. Um, all plants are green because they have uh, subcellular structures called chloroplasts, which genetic analysis indicates are very likely descended from cyanobacteria. And when cyanobacteria first evolved, they led to a significant change in the atmosphere of the Earth. Prior to the development of photosynthesis, the Earth's atmosphere, what, atmosphere was reducing. It didn't have much oxygen, had no free oxygen in it. After the development of photosynthesis, the atmosphere changed to an oxidizing atmosphere because it's got oxygen in it. And as all of us know, oxygen is essential to the life of all animals and, uh, and some plants. And one particular species of cyanobacteria called Plochlorococcus is by biomass the most plentiful species on Earth, lives in the ocean, and there is some evidence that it contributes to about 20% of the oxygen that we have uh, in our atmosphere today. There are many, many different species of blue-green algae or cyanobacteria, and Dolichosperum, Boronychia, and Microcystis all produce toxins that can harm people and animals, and that's what we call the harmful algae in harmful algal blooms. So, what is what is Headwall trying to to contribute here? Well, the cyanobacteria, because they're also that are blue green algae, have different photosynthetic pigments than normal algae. That's why they're called blue g blue green. And if it's a different pigment, it has a different spectrum. And with hyperspectral imaging, we can look at the spectra of pixels in our imagers, uh, in our images, and potentially detect oh this particular uh, spectrum seems to be like the harmful algae, the cyanobacteria, and uh, maybe we can identify them. And the reason this could, could be useful is these blooms happen slowly. They're not there all the time. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about how in the pond that we've been studying, the uh, population of the cyanobacteria rises and falls over the course of the year. Um, and early detection can lead to early uh, mitigation. There are some techniques that people can use to uh, actually reduce the amount of uh, cyanobacteria in a particular ecosystem after a bloom has started. And so what we've decided to do was to work with our, our partners at Coastal Ocean Vision to get what we call the ground truth. In this case, it's more the pond truth. Uh, and they're going to be going through and actually measuring the water at the same time that we are looking from the air with our hyperspectral imagers to uh, potentially come up with a way that we can fly one of our systems over a pond or any body of water and say, yes, there are, there are harmful algae here. No, there are not. Here's where they are. Here's where you should do your mitigation uh, methods. Or this, this particular beach should be closed because we've detected too much of this uh, dangerous material. So uh, I'll give a little bit of overview of what the headwall technology is that we're using to do this hyperspectral imaging. And uh, the imagers we use are a slit scan imager. So on the left, I have a picture uh, actually taken from some airborne data. You can see some striping in it. The aircraft goes back and forth and back and forth and slowly builds up the image. It builds up the image line by line. So instead of taking the full picture, we only take one line of the image, and then we take another frame, which is one more line, and ideally we have some motion that allows us to slowly build up the image. 
Now, why would we want to take just one line at a time? Next. The idea is that if we take that one line of the image, so that's a row of pixels, something like uh, you know, 640 to uh, uh, 1,000 pixels uh, across our detector, we disperse that so that each one of those image pixels is re-imaged at a different wavelength so that each pixel then has a spectrum. And so we take this single slit and we actually take, we use the entire detector to uh, get this full spectrum from every slit. And then we build up our image that way. And then we build up this hyperspectral image where each pixel has the spectrum. So how does the imager work? What we do is we have a four optic that makes an image onto a slit. Again, that's this first focal plane that's mostly dark, but transmits light just over a single uh, row that's about the same size as one of our pixels. It is re-imaged onto a electronic focal plane array with a three mirror relay. One of those mirrors is the fraction grading. And so because fraction grading reflects different wavelengths of light at different angles, we end up with the image I showed you in the last screen, which is uh, one line of pixels re-imaged at many different wavelengths, typically on the order of 300 different wavelengths. And so each time we take a frame, we get, in the case of the imager that I'll be talking about today, 640 spatial pixels and 270 spectral pixels. Uh, and then we take another line, we move forward, we take another line, we move forward, and we build our image up that way. So in addition to uh, the hyperspectral imager, uh, the research we did also, uh, our payload included a LIDAR, LIDAR just like radar, uh, and it's light detecting and raging. Uh, the instrument has um, 16 paired photo detectors and lasers. Each laser fires, and then the time to a return detected by the photo detector is measured. Uh, because light travels at a constant speed, if you measure the time it takes for the light to get there and back, you know twice the distance to it. And then uh, the lasers are spinning around. Uh, we're taking thousands and thousands and thousands of these per second. And uh, then that gives us these points in space. And each point has a latitude, a longitude, and altitude, and some other metadata, including, and this is important for this research, the GPS time at which that point was collected. So on the left, you can see a picture of the uh, the drone that we used for some of this research. Uh, it's a DJI M300 with the uh, head wall nano hyperspec and a LIDAR on it. And it flew back and forth over the pond. And then in the right picture, you can see a small uh, boat that has the, uh, the detector that is actually sampling the water and measuring and counting the number of various species of plankton in it. And you should be able to see that pond is green. This was in August, and this was when the pond really was toxic. Uh, fishing was banned, swimming was banned, and there was a tremendous amount of the cyanobacteria in the pond. So next, I want to talk a little bit about what our colleagues are doing in the boat. So they have a Raman imaging flow cytometer. And so the flow cytometer uh, cyto, I believe, means a cell, so it's a measuring cells. It's sucking up water. It's put. It, it's running it through a microfluidic channel, and then it gets into a little measurement chamber. And if if there is a cell detected, a laser blows onto it, and it gets a Raman spectrum from that. And the Raman spectrum, similar to the reflectance spectra that we're getting from sunlight, um, could give you a very accurate measurement of what the pigments are, and that can be used to distinguish the various different species. Um, they're using some, some sophisticated computers to figure all this out. And the net result is the folks from Coastal Ocean Vision are going back and forth over the pond in a boat. They are measuring the relative concentrations of all the different plankton species, in particular the harmful algae, at the same time that we are flying over them. Next, please. And so uh, this uh, this picture, I, if you see in the left hand slide, um, there's uh, something that looks like a, a aluminum tube because it's an aluminum tube. Uh, and inside of it is another version of this Raman imaging flow cytometer. And in the boat there, you can see our colleagues 
They went back and forth and back and forth over the pond. On the first image on the left, you can see before the um, flow cytometer is fully deployed. On the right hand side, you can see it, it drags along in the water and it's constantly sampling the water and uh, geo tagging and time tagging all the measurements that they're getting of the relative abundance of the various different plankton species. So here's another picture. Um, uh, we were out there um, in August. Uh, these uh, the toxic algae blooms tend to be correlated with large rain events because that increases the runoff and that, that in turn increases the uh, biologically available nitrogen and phosphorus that can lead to blooms of these toxic algae, algae including Dolichosperum. And uh, you can see this uh, a picture. They seem to form little rings. Uh, the cells are quite small, but there's enough of them that they really, really color the water. So in addition to this HABSTAT uh, HAB system that they're dragging around in a boat, there are four or five buoys that sit in the pond and they measure the relative abundance on, in particular of the um, Dolichosperum uh, harmful algae as a function of time. And I've got three red arrows there. We did our first flight over the pond along with our uh, colleagues in the boat in June. We did another mission uh, in mid-August, and we did one more mission in November. And you can see from the blue lines uh, in the upper left-hand side that there were very few of the toxic algae in June. There were few also in November, and our mission in uh, June, course uh, in in August, corresponded with near the peak of these toxic algae, and then. One of the things that seems to uh, affect the population of these uh, harmful algae is chytrid fungi, which my understanding is they latch onto the, uh, th those little rings of the Dolichosperum and cause them to sink to the bottom and die. And there was a bloom of these chytrids, which led to a crash in the population of the, the toxic algae uh, soon after our mission in August and well before our mission in November. So uh, I'm jumping a little bit ahead here, but this is a map where I have mapped three different types of uh, toxic algae uh, based on their, uh, their reflectance spectra. And I've circled several locations of the boat. So we, we're flying over the boat and we can actually find the boat in the imagery. Because we have spectral imagery, we can take the image and we can classify each pixel according to what its spectrum is most like. And so I've built a library with several different kinds of trees, a couple of species of Elodea, which is a, a, a non-algae plant that grows in the pond, three different types of toxic algae, and three different spectra that I was able to associate with the boat in the imagery. So the next slide shows some of these images. So RGB images taken from our ortho rectified uh, mosaics of the hyperspectral images. And then below that classified images, it's all pink because they are going through a soup of the toxic algae. And then that's how I can identify, oh yes, there's the boat there because I can see the fiberglass and the canopy and the, the, the white froth from its wake. And since I have the LIDAR, the boat is, the LIDAR measures altitude. Well, the boat is on top of the water. The water is flat. And so anything that show, sticks up above the water can be seen in the LIDAR point cloud. All of these little things that look like little worms in our images, on top of, you can see sort of a, 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 a grid pattern where we went back and forth and back and forth, north and south and north and south and north and south. Uh, and you can see there the path of the aircraft. And it took us a little while to coordinate well with the boats, but by the end of our mission, we got four different images where the boat was very clear, and I can get the exact GPS coordinates and the GPS times for each of those boat locations, and we can use those to very carefully correlate the data that were taken by the boat at those exact times. Next. And so here then uh, are the, the, the times and the GPS locations for them, this particular image, instead of being colored by altitude, is colored by GPS time, with blue being the beginning and red being the end. 
And so that's how I can extract from the LIDAR uh, the actual exact locations and times uh, of the boats for correlating these measurements. Okay, so here is a part of the study area where I've overlaid it on the Google Maps. Uh, the Google Maps, I don't know when these images were taken, but uh, not during a toxic algae bloom because the pond doesn't show a lot of reflection. Water doesn't reflect a lot of light unless it's got a lot of stuff in it, and it had a lot of stuff in it in August. Um, and you should also see that there's some lighter and darker areas here. That's because we're doing this, uh, we're doing all these measurements where all our light is coming from the sun. And so if a cloud goes over, uh, it gets a little darker. And if we get bright sun, we get a little brighter. And these intensity variations can have some effect on the classifications, but not a lot because the method that we're using to do the spectral, the, the, um, spectral classification, which we call spectral angle mapping, is somewhat insensitive to the absolute intensity of the spectrum. Okay, so this is not images from the uh, from the pond. This is some other work that we've done looking at um, in shortwave infrared spectra of geology. And this is an example of what one way that we can do the spectral classification is to build up a reference library based on the ground truth. So in this case, this is out in Cooperite, Nevada, and we flew over this area and our colleagues, the geologists, went out and collected a bunch of samples and they brought those samples back to the lab. They used their geological techniques to identify what the mineral composition of each of their samples were. And then they took spectra of, of them from a lab spectrometer. They gave me the spectra and then I used those as a reference library to compare to the spectrum in each of the pixels and say, OK, this spectrum, th this pixel right here, I'm going to color it yellow because it's gypsum. I'm going to color it red because it's Montmorillonite. And so that's one way of doing the classification. And when we continue this research, we will be we will probably be doing this with some spectra taken from samples taken from the pond. But for this preliminary work, we did another method, which I'll try and outline in the next slide. And that is I identify from the RGB image, I can say this is very clearly a tree. This is very clearly the algae in the pond. And if you look towards the middle of the image, very near the shore, there's some little stripy areas where it seems much brighter than others. And so I chose three different classes of the harmful algae, three different classes of trees, and built up a spectral library, not from ground truth, but from pixels in the image. And so I chose a region that looked relatively uniform, got an average spectra from a few thousand pixels of that, built up the library, and then used that library to then classify all the pixels in the image. Okay, the next slide, please. And so here are a couple of images of the reference spectra. Anybody who's familiar with uh, the spectral uh, biology will recognize in the spectra of the trees what's called the red edge, and that's because um, chlorophyll, which is one of the main pigments in, uh, in the blue-green algae and in uh, trees, has a very strong absorption in the visible, but there's not enough energy in infrared light to drive photosynthesis, and so the chlorophyll pigment doesn't reflect past about 700 nanometers, and then you get the reflection of cellulose, and if you think of a piece of white paper, that's almost 100% cellulose, it's very reflective of light. And so you can see in the various trees, uh, a lot of absorption, except in the green, around 550 nanometers, you could see a bump there, um, and then a high reflection out in the infrared. And then when we zoom in uh, on these lower levels, you can see that there is significant difference. In fact, a strong bump I see around 650 nanometers that's much more associated with these toxic algae than it is with the trees or with the elodea, which are the, uh, the flowering plants that live in the pond as well. Next, please. So let's go. Again, we, we, we flew this pond three times, once in June before there was a lot of toxic algae. But if you look at our imagery from June, there's a few bits of pink there. So there was some, it just wasn't a huge bloom. 
And part of the reason that there wasn't a huge bloom, there was there was a lot of this Elodea. Now, Elodea is a plant that I was first familiar with from Aquaria. Um, it looks sort of like a, uh, a feather brush, long strands. And uh, in the pond, it made these large mats of it. In fact, when our colleagues were driving around in the boat, they kept getting stuck because there was so much of this Elodea. And one theory is the, the toxic algae bloom was late this June, and that may have been because there was so much of the Elodea that it sucked up all of the available nitrogen and phosphorus or significant fraction of the available nitrogen and phosphorus and delayed the toxic algae bloom. But based on our spectral classification, remember I've made these toxic algae various colors of pink, there is some, particularly around the shoreline, and it seems also associated with the edges of these uh, Elodea. So let's go to the next one. Now we have superimposed on our spectral classification data from the boat driving around. And we've got the Dolichosperum, the Microcystis, and then non-toxic green algae. And they're not getting a lot. Um, they, these dots are uh, associated with the, the concentration um, in number per milliliter. But there's some correlation of areas where we are seeing a little bit of pink in our images, and they're seeing some of these, uh, some high concentrations of these toxic algae, but not yet a bloom. Okay. Now we go to August, where there was a lot, a lot, a lot of the toxic algae. And if you look at the RGB image, um, towards the center, I see a bit of a, uh, a line heading off to the northeast. And those seemed different enough to me that I decided to make them as different spectral classes. And then we do the classification. It really looks like there is a differentiation. There's two clear spectral classes um, of the HAB in the pond. And if we compare that now with the data taken by the sampler in the boat, we see very clearly, again, on the eastern side of the pond, it looks as though the the toxic algae is, the, the population is dominated by the Dilicusperum species. And on the east, uh, on the west side of the pond, it's um, dominated by the microcystis species. And this is to me the most intriguing result of the whole thing is that we, it appears that we can distinguish between toxic algae species just by the spectral characteristics as measured by the drone flying over the pond. And so this is preliminary work, but this indicates that this is something that we will pursue next year with more, uh, with more studies uh, and gr more ground truth. But it, again, it really does look like we've proven out the idea that we can see the, the, the toxic algae and we can identify different species just by their spectral reflectance. And to complete the study, let's look at the data from November. So after November, remember I said there was those, uh, those fungi that seem to have caused a crash in the population. We fly over, again, the pond's not green, but our, in our, our data seem to indicate that there are still some toxic algae. And most intriguing to me is in the northeast corner, the top of this, we see a little, a, a small area that's quite bright pink. That happens to be where a stream that is flowing through a cranberry bog, which is fertilized, is emptying into the pond and leading to more of, you know, a, a, a small bloom of this toxic algae. And if we again look at the correspondence, again, up there where I see that little pink thing, big red ball, but the rest of the pond is mostly uh, populated by the uh, the green algae. And so that's our basic results. Uh, very encouraging. We will be working uh, next year with our uh, colleagues at Coastal Ocean Vision to try and extend this research. And um, I would like to acknowledge uh, our main pilot is my colleague Charles Kepler. Uh, uh, Scott Gallagher from Coastal Ocean Vision ran the boat, did all the work. Um, my colleague uh, from our marketing team, uh, Ross Nakatsuji, organized everything for us. And the rest of the people at Headwall, uh, the people who build the imagers, the people who do all our, uh, all our work, 
And uh, there were several of our colleagues who were with us. These missions uh, generally take a bunch of people to get the drone in the air and get everything going. And uh, thank you very much for listening to this talk. Using various uh, 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 microbes for uh, uh, field experiment and especially algae for uh, biofilm formation and uh, blue green algae in general, we use it in uh, rice field also. So, this has a very good application in agriculture also. So, all of you might have enjoyed the lecture. And uh, if you have any uh, questions, you can ask uh, uh, Dr. Sahu or you can send the mail so that he can uh, send it to Dr. Carson. Or uh, you, you can ask uh, some question, head all team here. Uh, they can also, uh, like Franz, uh, Cisco, or uh, Bruce Hotham can also uh, give you some answer. If it is not answered, then the questions will be sent to Dr. Carson. Thank you, Rinesh.
pesticide and uh, nano urea applications again that will be very one rate so uh, we we'll take some time to migrate to the field and uh, install the compact uh, system there so please bear with us and thank you very much for participation throughout the session and to all of you we are starting the program around 9:30 So all are requested to be joined by 9:30. And tomorrow again is going to be a workshop on the growth technology for the next generation. And sure, we will put on the the chat box all the different programs for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.